right, looks like we are live, and I want to welcome everybody to Standing for Truth. My name is Donnie, and I am your host and moderator for tonight's exciting debate between Craig Trulia and Turretin Fan on the topic, the veneration of religious icons. I'm looking forward to this topic. One reason, because... Uh, you know, we've hosted over 300 debates on this channel on all sorts of topics, soteriology, nature of God, the Marian dogmas. We had a an excellent debate on that topic uh, last week, creation evolution. But I think this might be the first time we're actually engaging this specific uh, topic and question. And we've also got a, uh, a fresh face, a new uh, interlocutor for the debate dojo on uh, Standing for Truth, as we call it. So why don't we break the ice and, and get acquainted with our guests a little bit. And Craig, since uh, this is your first time here on the Standing for Truth platform, let's start with you firstly. Thank you uh, for doing this and giving us your time for this uh, important debate. And for the audience sake, a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the cool chair that we were talking about pre-show, and a little bit about your channel. Well, Donnie, it's good to be here. I'm not worthy of that intro. My gosh, the SFT and 3D and, I don't know, very, very impressive. Uh, otherwise, myself, a little less impressive, but I'll try to live up to the intro. The chair, because I got a bad neck. <laughs> I used to wear a fedora. I was the fedora guy until, like, I just stopped wearing it. It's like, oh, is it like he's against the fedora? It's like, no, just I need to support my neck. I <laughs> got a bad neck but um otherwise um just a normal layman who uh tries to evangelize the orthodox christian faith uh i have become a unwilling apologist and a really more of a recreational historian that's really more of my interest in this uh, i have some published work uh, that's peer-reviewed and i will be having an upcoming book on the history of the papacy which uh should be out this year god willing Awesome. I appreciate, uh, Craig, that introduction. Uh, for anybody who likes what they're hearing from uh, Craig in the chat, if you want to see more from him, please check the descri uh, description box of this video where I've got uh, the link to your, your YouTube channel for people to check out. Okay, Turretin fan, good to have you back. Definitely not your first time here. And I know you're no stranger to these kinds of debates. So Turretin, how have you been? A little bit about yourself and a little bit about your channel. Well, thanks very much. I'm a reformed blogger. I guess I've been doing that now for about about 15 years or so, and uh, happy to get involved in debates in various forms. And in, in the earlier days, it was just with uh, voice, and now thankfully we can do video uh, debates as well. So uh, I'm enjoying that. I'm looking forward to today's debate, which is one that uh, we seldom get to debate, and I think it's uh, an important topic, so I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely. I'm pumped for this. I know the audience is as well. Turretin, appreciate the uh, introduction. Same thing with you. To the audience, if you like what you're hearing from Turretin Fan and you want to see more from him and also Dan Chapa, who I understand you run your channel with, uh, do check the description box. You'll find links again to Craig Trulia's channel and uh, Turretin fans as well. Okay, gentlemen, appreciate the introductions. Now that we're acquainted with each other, let me go over tonight's format. And so we will be having a formal debate. Again, the topic is the veneration of religious icons. And we're going to be having 15-minute opening statements, followed by eight-minute uninterrupted rebuttals. Then we're going to have everybody's favorite part of these debates, a 50-minute discussion. This will be uh, structured in the form of cross-exam. And so we'll be having uh, 25 minutes each since Craig is starting with his opening statement as the um, taking the pro. Then um, for the 50-minute uh, cross-exam, he'll be starting with, with the cross. Then we'll have a five-minute closing statements where the debaters can wrap up their thoughts and points. And then this is where we get you guys in the audience involved. We'll have a roughly... 25 minute audience Q and A. So if you have a question for Craig, question for Turretin fan, just make sure you're tagging me. Tag me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth. That way I won't miss your questions. Okay, so with that, we're gonna get right into the 15 minute opening statements 
Craig, we're going to hand it over to you. Oh, I think Craig might have uh, dropped out real quick, but no worries. I think we've got him. Um... There we go. Craig, you left us in suspense, but you're back. And we're ready to go for opening statements. If you needed a screen share, any of you, you just let me know. Or if you're just going to kind of go through uh, your opening statement, that's that's great too. So whenever you're ready, Craig, floor is yours. Craig, are we coming in for you? It looked like you kind of froze up there. You are. I've noticed sometimes on StreamYard when people mute their microphones, it, it makes it lag for some reason. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing my little bars here showing that it's on my end. I've got no clue. Okay. No worries. We did lose you there for about 10 seconds. You, you left the stream, but we brought you back in. Everything looks smooth uh, now. And so I think we're good to go then. So whenever you're ready, you've got a 15-minute op opening statement. The floor is yours. All right, let's go. So I am grateful that Turton fan, one, has the courage to debate this, and two, is not a sophist. He sticks strictly with the facts. Most debates I find a rhetorical exchange is a little substance. They, that will be true today. I'm going to mostly focus on the traditional case in favor of Iconodulia. That does not mean it's not in the scriptures. Psalm 99.5 admonishes the reader to venerate his footstool. A reference to an icon of the visible, invisible God. Galatians 3.1 makes reference to an icon of the visible God, before whose eyes Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. The Protestant scriptural case against the Canadulia is not scriptural. Now, the second commandment doesn't apply to all images, even of angels, and the same makes no reference to the venerating the images. But in any event, scripture tends not to endorse icon veneration nor bans it, but icon veneration is a necessary consequence of scriptural teaching. Now, not venerating an image is at its core a Christological heresy if we accept the fact that we can venerate secular images. So if I can embrace a picture of my wife or son, then on what basis do I not treat an image of a saint or God in the same way? Either the saint or God are not real like my wife or son, that's obviously wrong, or they are not actually human and do not receive affection like my wife or son. That's wrong too. Now, sacrificing to images as if they were deities is different. I don't sacrifice my wife or son's images or icons for that matter. But in any event, though we have a scriptural prescription to venerate an icon, I won't press this further because debate with the debate would devolve into, I don't agree with your exegesis, which throws us into the realm of rhetoric. Instead, to quote Vincent de Lorenz, since the canon of scripture is complete and sufficient of itself for everything and more than sufficient, what need is there to join with it the authority of the church's interpretation? For this reason, because owing to the depth of holy scripture, all do not accept it in one the same sense, but one understands its words one way and another and another, so that it seems to be capable of as many interpretations as there are interpreters. So that's why we need sacred tradition. But Protestants use sacred tradition too. Let's look at the question of baptism just as a brief example. No passage in the scripture prescribes only believers' baptism, but nowhere prescribes that the children in households were baptized. Apologists like Sproul and Ferguson will appeal to tradition, even if they arrive at opposite conclusions. Now, in this case, the early evidence of Iconodulia's widespread practice can be surmised by unambiguous written and archaeological evidence of how religious art was used. Scholarship acknowledges anti-Nicene iconodulia. To quote Matthews and Muller, icons were intimately connected with the origins and growth of Christianity itself. That's in the Dawn of Christian Art, page 27. More ambivalent scholars such as Robin Jensen concede, most scholars now contest the idea that Christians were ever thoroughly aniconic, much less iconophobic, and that's in Compiling Narratives, page 3. And she also uh, specifies that participatory art existed. As follows, as I'm going to give, are the earliest and best instances of evidence for both, one, the existence of Christian art, and two, how it was used. The following texts are anti-Nicene. One, in Irenaeus, and against heresies, 
Christian saint speaks of Gnostics who possess images. Now he says about these Gnostics, they crowned these images and sent them up along with the images of the philosophers. And then he says, they have also other modes of honoring these images after the same manner of the Gentiles. So in this passage, nowhere does Irenaeus condemn the existence of images or crowning. He condemns the other modes of honoring these images, which is perhaps a reference to cultic acts such as sacrifice because it's in the same manner of the Gentiles. So the critique is how the images are used, implying there's a proper way to treat images. What is explicit is one, images exist, two, they are venerated. Now the Acts of John, um, is a Gnostic text which relates an apocryphal conversation where St. John tells a man that crowns and loves and reverences an image of St. John that he lives like an heathen. Now, this is a Gnostic rejection of icons, but this makes sense because of their rejections of material creation being spiritual. Now, considering Irenaeus implying that other modes of veneration of icons is heathen, but not applying this to crowning, this Gnostic critique is likely against the orthodox crowning of icons. But what is explicit? One, images exist. Two, they are venerated. Three, Eusebius in church history. Now, Eusebius, early church historian, criticizes a statue representing, they say, the woman with an issue of blood and an image of Jesus. Now, this implies the images were originally something else. He says that, at his feet of Jesus, the brazen cloak has a plant in front, which apparently healed diseases. And he speculates that the Gentiles of old who were benefited by our Savior would, according to a habit of the Gentiles, pay this kind of honor. Now, it's clear the statue was venerated as the only way one would be healed is by prostrating, imitating the hemorrhaging woman in this participatory art and touching the bottom of the cloak near the ground. Considering Eusebius' positive valuation of Christian art in at least two other places in the life of Constantine and um, History of the Christian Religions, another book, his critique is probably concerning the statues being repurposed pagan idols, not of art itself. But what is explicit? One, images exist. Two, they are venerated. Three, this practice is identified as existing since the time of Christ, and this analysis is from the early 4th century. Now, for Methodius of Olympus in Discourse on the Resurrection, a fragment from this anti Nicene work states that the images of our kings here are honored by all. For men do not, while they treat with respect those of the far more precious material, slight those of a less valuable, but honor every image in the world, even though it be of chalk or bronze. And one who speaks against either of them is not acquitted as if he had only spoken against clay nor condemned for having despised gold, but for having been disrespectful towards the king and lord himself. The images of God's angels, which are fashioned of gold, the principalities and powers we make to his honor and glory. Here, images are honored by all, and denigrating the image is not merely against the material, but what it represents. This implies the images of angels are made so they can be likewise honored. But what is explicit? One, images exist. Two, they are akin to other images which are venerated. Now, the following three texts are from later in the fourth century. Now, St. Gregory Anissa, in praise of blessed Theodore the Great Martyr, speaks of Theodore Heraclea's icon and relics. The relics are venerated by being touched, and the lifelike image of Theodore causes one to pour out tears of reverence. In this way, one implores the martyr who intercedes on our behalf. So what is explicit in this text? One, images exist. Two, they are venerated. Now in St. Epiphanius of Salamis or Pseudo-Epiphanius or Epiphanides, depending on which early attestation to, to who wrote this you go by, and against those who make images, to shorten the title, he criticizes icons, right? He's a critic, but what's he say? He identifies that you, the Iconodules, will say to me, the fathers detested the idols of the nations, but we make images of the saints in their memory, and we prostrate ourselves in front of them in their honor. Elsewhere, he writes in letter to Theodosius that I have often advised those who are reputed to be wise, bishops, doctors, concelebrants, 
to take down those things. Not everyone paid attention to me, actually only a few. So what is explicit in Epiphanius? One, images exist. Two, they are venerated. Three, this is the majority practice of the church, not of oddball heretics in the late fourth century. Now in the life of Pacomius, chapter 73 in the more recent translation, he recounts a dream, which is this. There was an icon, like a large picture, wearing a crown on his head. The crown was glorious. All around its sides are multicolored images. Before the icon were two great angels contemplating the Lord's image. Now, this appears to be a reference to a crowned image, something that Irenaeus and Acts of John observed centuries beforehand. So this shows continuity in Christian practice. Now it continues. Pacomius then prays to God in this story and towards the icon to learn the fear of the Lord. Then he's overwhelmed by a shining ray from the icon that the angels, which in the least averting their eyes from the image of the Lord that was appearing to the father Pacomius, were not affected by. So what is explicit? One, images exist. Two, they are prayed towards, just so people know Pacomius was active in the late third century. Now the following are second and third century archeological proofs. The Grotto of Nazareth. This is my eighth text so far. A graffiti at the Orthodox pilgrimage site that's pre-Nicene plausibly identifies an image of M, likely of Mary, that was Eucos Mesa or adorned. Now, nine, the Alexamenos Graffito. This is a pagan graffiti of a man worshiping below a crucifix with a donkey-headed man. It says Alexamenos worships God. Now, Tertullian, so there's this picture of a cross with what is an image of Christ, though it's blasphemous, on it of someone worshiping it. Now, Tertullian records in Ad Nationis in chapter 11 that Christians are accused of having a god with an ass's head, just like that graffito. Further detailing in the next chapter that Christians are called the priesthood of the cross, where the cross is treated as the object of worship. Tertullian does not reject this. Now, early archaeological evidence appears to buttress that the cross included an image of Christ. We see this in manuscript P75, stated, dated to 200 AD, that has the letters Toth and Rho, those are Greek letters, overlapped, and this is called the starogram, so they look like Christ on the cross in P75. Toth is manipulated to show a silhouette of Christ's body. Two other papyri, similar in that they contain starograms, are also dated before 325. And this is found in Rutledge Handbook of Early Christian Art, page 293. We also have from the third century, the crucifixion gem, which uh, second or third century, which also is a cross with Christ pictured. We likewise have a fourth century Syrian gemstone with the same. Now, according to Harley McGowan, a handful of surviving images collectively attest that a set of iconographic conventions for the depiction of the crucified figure of Jesus has been formulated by the early third century and was widely circulated across, or was circulated across the Mediterranean basin. That's in page 291 in the same book. Now, personally, I cannot find any anti-Nicene cross that does not include a picture of Christ. This is evidence against the idea that crosses were normatively bare. So the graffito explicitly proves one, Images exist. Two, they are venerated. Additional evidence from Tertullian suggests that this was normative. Now, 10, the catacomb frescoes of the Good Shepherd is more than one. Now, imagine walking to a catacomb in Italy that's dark. It's lit only by candles. You walk close to the wall and you see an image of a woman, her hands, eyes pointing towards heaven in prayer. You look up, copying her, and make out an image of the Good Shepherd on the ceiling. So what is explicit? Obviously, one, images exist, but it's fairly certain that one was supposed to pray to God towards the Good Shepherd. This would be treating it as an icon. Now, Jensen surmises that such art is participatory, but I have to demand this understanding that when partici participation requires prayers, this is iconodulic. Now, there are additional ev evidences. In 11, Doris Europas, evidencing uh, participatory art. 12, the Good Shepherd, picture and communion cups by Tertullian. Um, that means they're probably venerating in the same way that the catacomb art was. 13, Basil the Great, stating that the uh, icon of the 40 martyrs. Could the martyrs through the icon look upon the worshipers there? 
14, what appears to be apotropaic art referenced by Clement of Alexandria, 15. Chrysostom on Malatius icon, which by the way, uh, scholars recognize the multiple icons of Malatius indicate that he his intercessions were what was being sought. And 16, the oldest legend of Agbar from the life of Adai ascribes protective powers to an icon of Christ, which is interesting because Eusebius has another legend of Agbar where the image is made magically, not by just being painted. So perhaps this uh, story of an icon is actually older than Eusebius from the fourth century. Now I won't dwell on these because they don't include directions. I'm gonna be sticking with what's explicit. Now here's my conclusion. Prasid Plemix has an uphill battle because they have to show contrary to all the extant and explicit evidence that art was not venerated. They ignore mainstream sources like Gregory of Nyssa, Basil, Pacomius, Methodius, Epiphanius, who witnessed the ubiquity of the practice. Archaeology uncoincidentally backs them up. Whomever in this debate makes more historical inferences will lose this debate. So on this basis, Icona Dooley wins the day. If anyone has any questions about any citations, I only include them for the rare sources. You want from the common sources, you could follow up with me later. And that's my opening statement. Craig, thank you very much for that 15 minute opening statement. Turretin fan, we're now gonna hand it over to you for your 15 minute opening statement. I also wanna remind the audience that if you do have questions for the debaters tonight, do make sure to uh, tag me either at Donnie or at Standing for Truth, and let's keep it on topic as much as possible. So with that, Turretin fan, the floor is yours. You've got 15 minutes, go ahead. Thanks so much. Images for religious veneration are, according to scripture, a grave evil. First, they distract from the true image of God. Human beings are said to be in the image of God, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, and 9, 6. The husband, in a special way, 1 Corinthians 11, 7, and Christ, in the most special way, is the image of God, 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and Colossians 1, 15. Notice, though, that Paul in Colossians says that Christ is the image of the invisible God. Invisibility is one of God's attributes. Thus, Hebrews 11, 27 describes Moses as enduring, as seeing him who is invisible. And Paul in 1 Timothy 1, 17 praises God as the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. The non-portrayal of God, including the non-portrayal of Christ, is anticipated by the New Testament. Thus, the Apostle Peter writes, 1 Peter 1, 7 and 8, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Jesus likewise anticipated that people would not see him. John 20, 29, Jesus says unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Moreover, it is the very next two verses that explain that we are to believe by the word, not the picture, John 20, 30 and uh, 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life through his name. John can you, continues the same thing in his first epistle. 1 John 4.12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. And again, 1 John 4.20, if a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God? whom he has not seen. Maybe somebody will think that although it's not a picture of God, it's still a picture of Christ's body. But again, the true image of Christ's body is twofold. First, the people of God, the church, is the body of Christ, Ephesians 4.12, 1 Corinthians 12.12 and 27, and Romans 12.5. Moreover, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper illustrates both us, 1 Corinthians 10.16, and second, but primarily, Christ. Matthew 26, 26, and 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. In fact, the body and blood of Christ shown through the bread and cup are the one approved 
representation of Christ. But you'll notice that it's not an, a likeness. The bread doesn't look like his body. That's not the point of the sacrament, to make a picture of Christ. But that is the only divinely authorized illustration. Second, not only do they distract, as I just uh, pointed out from the true image of God, but they're an abomination to God. When Samuel wanted to call out the sinfulness of Saul's rebellion, he compared it to witchcraft, and he compared Saul's stubbornness to idolatry. The prohibitions against the making of idols in the Old Testament are numerous. I'll give you some examples. We don't have time to read all of them. Leviticus 26, 1. You shall make you no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image. Neither shall you set up in any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it, for I am the Lord your God. Notice that the prohibition was not against art absolutely, but against art for the purpose of relig religious veneration, to bow down to those idols or images. That's key. After all, there were artistic renderings in God's tabernacle and temple. Psalm 97, 7 says, Confounded be all they that serve graven images, that boast themselves of idols. Worship him, all you gods. You might think that this means that idols are prohibited because they represent false gods. No, even idols of the true God are prohibited. Deuteronomy 4, 15 through 24 says, Take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any beast that is on the earth, the likeness of any winged fowl that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that is in the waters beneath the earth, and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven. And when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them and serve them, which Lord thy God has divided unto all nations under the whole heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you forth out of the iron furnace. Notice that picture. Not a like an idol being cast in metal and brought out of a furnace. The people of Israel, God's people, are the thing that's coming out of the furnace. He brought you forth out of the iron furnace even out of Egypt, to be unto him a people of inheritance, as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me, this is Moses speaking, for your sakes, and sp swear that I should not go over Jordan, and that I should not go in unto that good land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not go over Jordan, but you shall go over and possess that good land. Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image, or the likeness of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Notice that God's prohibition on images is in the strongest possible terms and is justified by jealousy. Why jealousy? Because whenever God is worshipped using images, the glory that is to be given to God is instead given to a lie. None of these pictures are pictures of Jesus. None of the pictures uh, that you... that. Michelangelo paints are pictures of the people he's describing. They're either models or his own imagination, but they're not the truth. That's not what you're doing. Imagine if you take a picture of some model and tell everyone that's the picture of your wife. It's nonsense. It's a lie. And it's not limited to the images in the round. Notice how Ezekiel describes it. Ezekiel 8.10. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And the worship doesn't have to be sacrificing animals. It can be bowing down to them. Isaiah 2, 8 and 9. Their land also is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. And the mean man bows down, and the great man humbles himself. Therefore, forgive them not. It can be kissing them. Hosea 13, 2. And now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Greet one another with a holy kiss. That's what scripture teaches us. It's not that we're forbidden to kiss altogether, but icons won't kiss you back. They're not part of that aspect of our religion. Indeed, the Old Testament records two times when the people of Israel represented God uh, by the use of golden calves. And in both cases, God's extreme displeasure was recorded. Exodus 32, 4, and he received them at their hand, referring to the jewels of the people of Israel, and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a, a molten calf. 
And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Similarly, 1 Kings 12, 28, whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold, thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And again, 2 Kings 10, 28 through 29, Thus Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel. How be it, from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. These were not the worship of Baal. These are the worship of the Lord in a way that's not authorized by God. In fact, it's condemned. It's not just that he, he, he doesn't say to do it or it raises an issue about it. It clearly and unequivocally condemns the use of these idols. On the contrary, Jesus taught, well, let me stop here. Some people will say that that was the Old Testament, but now we're in the New Testament. God was against idols then, but maybe now someone will say he approves of them or even commands the use of them. But Jesus taught, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that comes back to this fact that God is invisible. We are not to make images of God because one of his characters Characteristics is invisibility. He does not want us to make any pictures of him. He's repeatedly told us that. Likewise, Luke described Paul on Mars Hill this way, Acts 17, 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Paul's sermon stated of God, Acts 17, 25, neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. Paul contrasts Christian worship from heathen worship as Craig was describing, this is the contrast between Christian and heathen worship, not by changing who the idols were of, but contrasting Christian worship to worship that involves idols. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.9, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned, from, uh, turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. First Corinthians 12.2, You know that you were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Indeed, Paul explains that the use of idols to represent God is part of man's corruption. Romans 1, 20 to 23, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Small wonder then that Demetrius the silversmith was so concerned about the spread of Christianity that he assembled a mob at Ephesus, Acts 19, 23 to 27. At the same time there arose no small stir about that way, the Christian way, for a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation and said, Sirs, you know that by this craft we have our wealth. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands." so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worships. Demetrius realized that Paul's religion, the Christian religion, was not simply the replacement of one statue with another, but a worship of an invisible God and consequently a threat to his livelihood. Paul is not alone in his condemnation of idolatry. In the revelation of Jesus Christ that John gave, he writes, Revelation 9.20, And the rest of the men which were not killed by the plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see, nor hear, nor walk. That's that sense of dumb when we heard earlier about dumb idols. They don't have that ability. Icons can't talk to you. And in his first general epistle, John writes more tenderly and to the point, 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Why does this debate matter? It matters not only for the reasons that I've just said above, but also for the reasons that Craig didn't say. The Seventh Ecumenical Council is the reason that icons are a mandatory part of Eastern Orthodox church life. 
the, the Seventh Ecumenical Council didn't just say, it's okay to have icons. It's okay to have religious art. It's okay to participate. It condemns those who debate the matter further. And more significantly, uh, those who apply scripture's prohibitions to those venerable images or to those who call them idols. I mean, today or tonight, I've done all three. If they're right, I would be in serious trouble, but I'm, I'm not wrong. This scripture is abundantly clear that we're not to make images of God or to for religious veneration purposes to make images. Not that we can't have any art, but for these purposes, it's forbidden. We could get more into the history, uh, but I'll briefly point out that before this Seventh Ecumenical Council, 30 years before, there was a large council that did exactly the opposite. They condemned images. And I, while there's parts of what they have to say, I would totally disagree with. Their view of Mary, Mary was far too, uh, too high in the sense of elevating her above where she should be. But they were right in identifying the fact that the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is the one authorized image of Christ, and that it's wrong to draw pictures and to call that the, those pictures God, or to, to describe them as that, or to say this is, this is God, or to uh, use this paint or wood as, the, as your way of representing God. And to try to justify it in various ways that people did in that time are also wrong. And uh, hopefully in the rebuttal section, I'll have time to answer uh, Craig's points and his abundant evidence, which is interesting to consider. I'll reel back any of the remaining time. Turretin fan, thank you very much for that 15 minute opening statements. statement. Gentlemen, that concludes the opening statements. Good job to the both of you, Craig and Turretin. As always with these debates, I appreciate the, the time and work put into uh, the preparation. And we got a lot of solid points for us to discuss and engage over the rest of the debate. So Craig, we're gonna hand it back to you. We are in the uh, eight minute rebuttal phase of tonight's debate. And so whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. You've got eight minutes for rebuttal. All right, I really appreciate uh, Turretin Fan's argument there and him going through the scriptures uh, I, it's hard to say this, but my honest analysis of what we just heard is it's got three crucial issues. One, it makes a false equivalency that images always equal idols. If you don't make that equivalency, then almost all the exegesis is heard is wrong. And so that's pretty crucial. Number two, there were very specific scriptural Christological errors that were made. And three, that dovetails why this is an important issue in Nicaea 2. And some of the history given surrounding that was just not accurate. So I will correct the record. Now, there's a big reason why I avoided getting a lot into the scriptures in this, because it's exactly for the reason I quoted Vincent de Lorenz. Yes, the canon scripture is complete. Yes, it's sufficient of itself for everything, as the saint says. It's more than sufficient. But why is there a need to join with it, with the scripture, the authority of church interpretation? It's not that because the scripture doesn't actually explain all matters of the faith. It's because owing to the depth of Holy Scripture, it's written by God after all, all do not accept it in one and the same sense. One understands it one way, another in another. There are, there's going to be Protestants that don't think there should be any images of Jesus. And then there's others who say, well, it's okay if there's an image as long as you don't use it in any sort of religious sense. So the Protestants aren't on one page on this. And so we need tradition in order to inform the scriptures. This is a separate debate, but there's a reason why God has given teachers to the church. And if you read the pastor epistles from St. Paul, normatively in the scriptures, the only explicit examples of teachers in the church are those ordained by the apostles and those ordained by those ordained by the apostles. The Orthodox can lay claim to that. Protestant sects, other than perhaps the Anglicans, cannot. Now let's get to the false equivalency of image equals idol. Now, um, Tartan fan says that the, the, in the scripture, images are a grave evil. He essentially quotes the second commandment, but then he admits that there is the allowance of making other images. So I don't quite understand this argument. It's, it's said over and over and over, and it's an obvious contradiction. So obviously 
the second commandment is not a ban on images because then God couldn't then tell you to go make images, all right? Like there's the image of the cherubim and next to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, as I also mentioned, like the Ark of the Covenant, we have religious art paid veneration as we saw in Psalm 99.5. Now, I want to get into, I think, is the Nestorian Christology presume, presumed upon. Now, this is sort of a meme in apologetics, and I really don't like this because I'm really trying to be sincere, that you just call whatever you don't disagree with a heresy in some far-flung way. You spin the heresy wheel. But we saw the argument made. I'm going to quote, Christ is the image of the invisible God. Yes, he is according to his divine essence, but not according to his human essence. I submit this to you. When St. Thomas the Apostle said, my Lord and my God, did he not see God? <laughs> right? He wasn't invisible when he said, my Lord and my God. He saw God. So what are we talking about? There's a Greek word for this. It's hypostasis. All right. So the person of Christ, and say hypostasis in English, is divine and human. We see in the Gospel of John, the word of God was made flesh. God is flesh, right? God has flesh, but it doesn't mean the divine nature has flesh because God is spirit, right? God is love. Love is not flesh, right? It's God's essence is not flesh, but God has flesh because God's person. He took on humanity. He didn't take on a human person. That's adoptionism. All right. That's why I said there's an historian Christology here, because if we accept that when you looked at the man Christ, you looked at God himself. It's just like uh, Mary, did he know when you look upon the face of your son, you look at the face of God, right? So even the Christmas songs recognize something that's not historian here. And so if you, if Thomas can look at God and say, my Lord and my God, and he's not talking about the invisible, he's talking about the person looking right at him, then clearly you could depict what's there. The question is whether that's permissible. And that's where I said we have these disputing interpretations of scripture, which is why we look at the teachers that God has given to the church that the pastoral epistles talk about, what have they bequeathed to us? And as we go to the earliest church evidence, as Eusebius says, since apostolic times, they had images. That's how they were honored. All right. Now we see that we can't allegedly bow down to God, uh, to images. And yes, yeah, you can't bow down to idols because that's the context of the second commandment, right? Because the second commandment says you can't make images and you can't bow down to them. But we already know it's not talked about the making of any images whatsoever, right? Because there's the cherubim that are made. We do have images of lions and, and bulls and all that. The issue is the making of images that are pagan idols. That's what it's actually um, banning. And so if it's banning the making and bowing to idols, that does not equal the bowing to religious images because, in fact, the Ark of the Covenant was bowed to, which I cited and proved. Um, we also see in 1 Chronicles 29, 20, that both Solomon and God are bowed down to at the same time. So you could bow down to material creation. This is something that exists in the scriptures. Um, that does not mean you're offering propitiatory sacrifice to Solomon because that would be idolatry. It doesn't mean you're giving propitiatory, propitiatory sacrifice to the cherubim. That would be idolatry. There's a difference. You can't just make an equivalence and not show how this thing is actually equivalent. You can't just presume upon it. And if you just presume upon it, everything to turn uh, turns and fan makes sense. But if you don't presume upon it and you look at actually what the second commandment presumes upon, it no longer makes sense because the second commandment only bans the making of pagan idols and bowing down to pagan idols. The fact that the scriptures permit the making of non idols, the other images and religious images at that, would then wouldn't that apply? It also allows the religious service to those images because they're not banned, right? That would be the parallelism if we're gonna be consistent. Now, let me add on the issue of Nicaea 2 on its focus on icons. It sounds unfair. How could Nicaea 2 say bad things about people um, that won't venerate icons? In fact, it bans them from not venerating icons for the reason we just demonstrated, because the Christology is wrong. It would make people say, well, when Thomas said, my Lord and my God, when he's looking at God, well, he was really just looking at the man, Jesus Christ, and not really God. No, because the scripture says the word of God was made flesh. All right. He was looking at God himself. The person of God is divine and human. 
And so, as I said in my opening statement, the arguments against Iconodulia presume upon a faulty Christology as a default. They presume that God is dead and he's not there to be venerated, or he never was there. He's just mythical, so he has no type, uh, prototype to be venerated. Um, that he's not really human, so you can't really venerate him, right? But Christ was human. The flesh is, you know, Christ, the, the word of God is made flesh. So all the presumptions are heretical, and so it's rightly a condemned heresy because it's a Christological heresy. My last point is the Council of Hyra was not a large council. It didn't have a single patriarch. The Metropolitan of Ephesus was over it. All the world's synods condemned it, including the Franks in Rome 769. And that is the end of my rebuttal. Craig, thank you very much for that eight minute uninterrupted rebuttal. Turgeon fan, we're now gonna hand it over to you for your eight minute rebuttal whenever you're ready. The floor is yours, and I'll start your timer. Thanks very much. As we've heard, the focus of Craig's presentation was on historical practice. And there certainly has been a lot of religious veneration of images whether those are whether we're talking about in the east or the west whether we're talking about christians or pagans it is indeed a widespread pagan practice to have images and it's not a practice that's in any anywhere in scripture approved of the religious veneration of images or the making an any in specifically making images of god even when it comes to the person of jesus christ the I'm sorry, there's a, some, someone's mic is still hot and I, I'm hearing pages turning and stuff like this. Uh, but the, even in the New Testament, when it comes to Jesus Christ, there's no word picture given to us so that we would know exactly what he looked like so we could make a picture. We're not encouraged to do so. And indeed, the Old Testament explicitly gives as one of the reasons for not showing God with a form when he was giving the commands on the mount was to avoid people making images of God. So a scripture's command is fairly clear that we're not to make images of God. It's stated in the Old Testament in fairly clear and unequivocal terms, but we're told scripture, in, one person interprets it one way, one person interprets it another way. But then when we're asked to go to this tradition that we're told, where the first mention were made, the first mention made is Irenaeus talking about what Gnostics did, that Gnostics possessed these images and crowned them and so forth. Is that the tradition of the apostles that we want to appeal to? You have some problem with uh, Protestant or orders and them not having properly ordained folks. Do you think the Gnostics did? Irenaeus didn't think so. He didn't think, he, did, he denied that they had, that they were in uh, any real way connected with the apostles. And he was right. They weren't. They were not following the same religion. There's another Acts of John, another potentially Gnostic text that rejects icon usage. And that all that shows is that someone at the time was using icons. Why should we be surprised that these that John writes in 1 John, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Is there any doubt that this is something that was going to affect the church? We see that the Bible warned about people who are going to forbid to marry and command to abstain from meats? Do you, is that a heresy that arose in the early centuries? Of course. This too is not, is not a new thing. It was a temptation to the people of Israel from the time of Moses. It was really only effectively stamped out after the return from the exile to Babylon. That's when you start, stopped seeing so much of this in, among the Jews. What about Eusebius mentioning a statue that maybe it was a repurposed statue? Okay, he mentions a statue. You, you mentioned Methodius of Olympus, Gregory of Nyssa, and so forth. Now, certainly there comes a time in church history when there does become a love of these images and a desire to incorporate them into worship. And undoubtedly you find some resistance to that, the, uh, Epiphanius, as an example, saying everybody else around him in this area that he's a familiar with are getting more and more into having these images, and he's telling them, take them down. Or 
somebody, you know, I know he mentioned maybe it's a pseudo Epiphanius or something else, but in any event, this author from that time period is standing up against encroaching idolatry. And that does show that people were doing it at the time. But so what? Why is that tradition we should hold on to? Remember, Vincent of Lorenz Maxim, the one that he said we need to have church tradition to do, is he said in this in the universal church, the Catholic church is how he, is the term he used, in this universal church, it's all possible care must be taken that we hold the faith which has been believed everywhere, always, and by all. Not just the faith that was believed by the majority, not just the faith that was believed by a, a some strand of Gnostic heretics or some faith that's reflected in grotto paintings of presumably quite ancient derivation, but everywhere, always, and by all. And we're supposed to accept that this use of religious imagery is should be so persuasive that it sets aside the, the prohibition on making a picture of God. That's, that's a serious claim. And what, what have we described that, that veneration consists of? We, we didn't mention crowns. I don't recall scripture specifically uh, in any of the scriptures I quoted, specifically referring to crowning these things. But again, what's the, what is the prohibition in scripture about? The prohibition in scripture is about the use of images for worship. It is prohibited to worship images of a false god, but it's also prohibited to make worship images of the true god. And that's the point of Deuteronomy 4, 15. Take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image. That's the reason why they were not shown what God looked like that day. But it's not that there were no theophanies in the Old Testament. There were. People spoke to God. Jacob wrestled with God. Don't forget that God, although God is the invisible God, there have been appearances. There have been manifestations. And yes, Thomas, standing in front of Jesus, rightly said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus is. But that painting or isn't. It's not even a painting of Jesus. But that painting is not God, and it's not authorized, and it doesn't look like him. That's not who, that's not what Jesus looks like. It's a lie, if you, someone says it is. In the, in the effect of putting the name Christ underneath this picture and saying this is Christ, it's not. It reminds me of that art, I forget the, whether the school of art it is, but there is a French artist who made a painting of a pipe and then said in French, uh, in large letters, this is not a pipe. Now, it's been interpreted various ways, but the point is, one, one interpretation that's valid is that it's a painting of a pipe, not a pipe. And this same thing, this, this picture is supposed to be a picture of God because Jesus is both God and man in two natures and one person, which I affirm against the Nestorian error. But the painting of Jesus is not a painting of a divine human nature. It's not even the picture. Of, it, it's just somebody's imagination. It's paint on a piece of wood. It's not approved of by scripture. What about Psalm 99.5? If I recall correctly, this is the verse that says that we should worship at the footstool of God, not that we should worship the footstool. But maybe we'll have a chance to explore that and some of his other claim, uh, Craig's other claims when we get to the second half of the cross-examination section, which I look forward to uh, shortly. Turretin fan, thank you very much for that eight-minute rebuttal gentlemen that concludes the opening statements and also the rebuttals very comprehensive debate so far excellent job to the both of you and we're now entering the 50 minute cross exam so i'm excited for this one i'm excited to see how you both engage each other's points brought to the table to the audience i do want to remind you yes i'm all caught up on questions uh, great question so far. I will uh, continue collecting questions during the next 50 minutes of discussion. So with that, Craig, we're going to hand it over to you. And since Turretin just ended with his rebuttal, we're going to give you the first 25 minutes to lead the way in cross-exam. Go ahead. Turretin fan, it's great to finally talk 
to you instead of, uh, I guess, at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> the um so yeah let's let's get to it and tease out some of these things um i want to know very specifically what specific scripture bans the veneration but not worship of a religious image of christ and his saints so the terms veneration and worship are often used interchangeably and in the context of religious veneration, I suppose if you're suggesting that some, the two are equivalent, religious veneration and worship are the same. They're not, they're not two different things. But if you mean, is there some other way in which you could venerate something that belongs to God other than by offering it religious veneration, I suppose it might depend on what you exactly mean by that. If you want to serve as a doorkeeper for the house of the Lord or something like that, that's very, very specifically, Maybe this will clarify things. Would you agree that the second commandment is particularly banning the worship and the serving of propitiatory sacrifices and set and propitiatory rites to the idols? And so that would be what is coupled with the bowing or whatever else to the pagan idols. The second, no, the second commandment is broader than that. And like many of the commandments, it, it, it's an, uh, a synecdoche, a synecdoche. It's, it's one part for the whole, the same, in the same way that the sixth commandment prohibits not only murder, but also hatred in the heart. The second commandment not only encompasses the most gross and uh, blatant forms of uh, violation, but also the lesser forms. That's one of the reasons okay. I went so to the scriptures. Christ explicitly unpacks for us that murder is hatred of the heart as well. It's on the spectrum of murder. Where does a scripture explicitly impact for us that the veneration of anything created is the same thing as the worship of pagan idols? So again, I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's the same thing as worship of pagan idols. I'm, I suggested that the second commandment is broad enough to encompass both the worshiping of God by images, but also the worshiping of things that are not God by by images. So that, that was my first point. It's not to suggest that it's the same as worshiping pagan gods, but Deuteronomy 4.15 is an example of an explicit command not to make images of the true God for the purposes of worshiping them. Now, how in De at the time of Deuteronomy 14 could you make an image of the true God before he was incarnate? Was it even possible? Yes, there were many theophanies of God in the Old Testament period. One example of that is when God appeared to Abraham. In other words, when God wrestled with Jacob. What did he appear Jacob. as to Abraham? He appeared as a man, as a, as a person journeying. And the scriptures identify these men were particularly what kind of beings? They looked like human beings. They looked like human beings, but what were they actually, according to... Um, Genesis chapter 18. I'm not sure what, I, I'm not sure if you're, are you saying, suggesting that one of the people that was there was God himself and the others were angels? If that's what you're referring to, and they're broadly referred to as angels, like the angel of the Lord is often a description. It looks like you're frozen. I hope, you, I hope you're just paused in thought. Uh-oh. I think he might be frozen, Donnie. <laughs> yes. I guess we'll wait for him to uh, come back to us. I'll put the timer on on pause. Looks like he's kind of coming back as he legs out a little bit there. To the audience, I'll remind you again, I'm all caught up on questions. If you do have questions, tonight's topic, the veneration of religious icons, please do make sure that you're uh, sending them in. And so we can have, as uh, usual, uh, a fun audience Q&A. Craig, are we coming through for you or are you? <clears throat> I'm seeing him update every like 10 seconds or so to a new pose. Right. It's a new pause and thought, as you said. Craig, if you can hear us sometimes to fix the problem, because you've been good, you've been good up till now, maybe leave the studio and... oh. Let me see here. 
We've got two Craigs. So Craig has brought in his twin to finish off the debate for us. There you go. I hope I get my two minutes back from that. Of you course. Do. Of course. I've got your timer so, paused. So, uh, so, so just to, to resume where we were in Genesis 18. Um, and so would you concede that the beings that visited appearing as men to, um, to Abraham were angels? One was the Lord and the others were angels. The, two, the ones that were angels went on towards Sodom. Now, the Lord as he appeared, was it the Lord incarnate, the Lord made flesh? Nope. No, he just, but he did have a visible appearance that you could see, and Abraham did. See. What was his visible appearance made up of? We're not told. Okay. And so, presuming, because it's the only evidence we have, that he's got to be made of some sort of essence, and the essence that's being seen is like the other men, which are angels, and it's called the angel of the Lord. So even the word angel is there, by the way. Um, it would seem to me that the most explicit interpretation of scriptural evidence is that the Lord appeared as an angel. Would you say that this is the simplest interpretation of the evidence, or would you uh, prefer some other inference? I believe that scriptures teach that angels are ministering spirits, and therefore their appearance is also not a physical thing. They are, they are also spirits, not, not physical. They're not material. But they're, they're not vacuous, right? The angels are something, they're just not made of flesh like us. They are not made like, they are real, but they are not material. And their appearance, in this case, was disguised as human beings. Do they have uh, like a nature or a feces? Like God has a nature or a feces, if they use a, a scriptural term? He, yes, they have. A, the Hebrew says that they do. Okay. And so did the Old Testament permit the creation of angelic images? It doesn't explicitly prohibit the depiction of angels. Does it ever prescribe it? Uh, there are some angels that are uh, on the ark that were, those ones were specifically uh, okay. commanded. Yeah. And would it make sense because angels were visible that you could portray things that are visible because they actually were visible, like we saw in Genesis 18. Would you at least admit that makes sense? I think in general, we're permitted to do whatever God hasn't forbidden us to do. So I don't think you'd need a special reason to make it. No. To and so it just uh, cuts you. So you would affirm the regulative principle. I'm just trying to figure out this, the uh, epistemological paradigm you're working with. For worship, the, the regulative principle is a principle of worship. But in terms of just making pictures in general, or having art, that, that began before the flood. And we, uh, we didn't need a positive command saying you may do make art, but to worship it, to venerate, that's where we run into a scriptural prohibition. But again, uh, but the idea of venerating the art or, or anything created, heaven, earth, above, below the water, um, that's an inference you make. It's not actually explicitly there in the text. Now, no, would you say it, then it you find your says, inference to be justified by something else in the text? It literally says, thou shalt not bow down to it. To anything it, in heaven above, heaven below. But then how would you explain Turret and Fan then First, uh, uh, First Chronicles 29.20 that both God and Solomon are, are given proskinesis at the same time? Well... There's two possible explanations of that. One of the explanations is that people were doing what's right, but that they were only offering a civil veneration to the king. And the other option is that the people were sinning by, by offering veneration to the king when they should have only offered veneration to God. But okay. the scriptures don't say one way or another. They just describe the event. I think most viewers, I think it's implied to be positive. So then would you at least concede that it is sensible that there are different sorts of veneration. And so some would be permissible, like venerating the king in that instance, um, Joseph's brothers bowing to him, and some wouldn't be, like bowing to a pagan idol. Would, would that be a valid distinction to make? I think it's valid to make a distinction between religious veneration and civil veneration or familial veneration, of course. Is it possible to serve um, men and by so doing serving God? In a very broad sense, in the sense like in the way that deacons serve men and thereby serve God. 
How about uh, when slaves serve slave masters in doing so, they're rendering service unto the Lord? Yes, but not by bowing down to them and, and worshiping them. Well, no one, do you believe that Orthodox worship other men that we offer propitiatory sacrifice and we propitiate them? I believe that there is kissing of icons of people who are no longer around. But that's not, so what do you can see that's not a propitiatory sacrifice? I don't think it has to be a propitiatory sacrifice to be an inappropriate form of religious worship. Okay, so then is it inappropriate to kiss an image of your own wife or children? If it's offered as a religious, in a religious sense, which is not normally how people would do it, then it would be. But obviously most people don't do it in a religion, as a religious act of uh, an act so of you make religion. you make a distinction between showing affection in religious circumstances and affection in irreligious circumstances. So then would it be banned to give people a, a kiss of peace because that is a religious circumstance where people were commanded to kiss one another in the Book of Romans? It, we're actually that's the one image of God that we are allowed to kiss is our fellow believer. And so we could show affections to fellow believers. Could we show affections to fellow believers if they were to be pictured? Well, if we're doing it as a, in a way that's intended as a religious veneration, then no, it wouldn't be appropriate. And which, which scripture specifically specifies that there's distinction between showing affection in religious-only contexts and others in civil contexts or contexts that they must be living and not dead religious people? So it's not a question of, of whether they're dead or not. The question is what uh, the intent of the person doing the act. Then there's the distinction in the intent is illustrated by Naaman. If you may recall, Naaman told the prophet that when he went back to his home country, he would be forced to uh, kneel alongside of the king who was offering worship to a false god and sought permission to do so. At, as a, as a way of supporting up and holding this person he was holding, but without the intent of worshiping the thing that was being worshipped. All right. Now, do you uh, believe that Christian icons and pagan images are functionally equivalent? Yes. All right. Um, and do you believe that Orthodox think that icons are indwelt by deities like the pagans believed that they're idols? Nobody knows what pagans believe and their idols because there's not just one pagan out there. There's various levels of folly to pagan worship. Are you aware that both um, Yas Elsner speaks of it being common knowledge that the pagan idols were indwelt, were believed to be indwelt, and that both Menigius Felix and Augustine, and I think there's others, but those someone top of my head, believe that the that would they would actually say that Christians don't consecrate their images like pagans consecrate their idols so that they're uh, not indwelt. Um, so are you aware of that? So, so, for example, Augustine made a differentiation in the pagans of his day, which is, of course, just one century. But, but the pagans of his day, he, he distinguished between the kind of superstitious, ordinary folk who did treat the, these idols as though they had some uh, some connection to a, a, a human-formed God and other ones who had more of a philosophical connection and said, oh, no, this kind of represents that God. This represents, And when they say the God, they might mean the sun or the power of the sun, something like that. So Augustine yes, made I, that differentiation. You're making reference uh, to Sermon 198. Are you aware in Sermon 198 that he speaks of that they offer propitiatory sacrifice to these images and that they consecrate them? And so that's the context of this critique. Oh, I don't recall that particular point, but uh, it, my point is that he distinguished between different kinds of pagans. That's, that's the point I'm raising. But are you aware that even those different sort of pagans were doing the exact same pro pro process of consecrating and giving participatory sacrifice to the images? I'm not, that's not something I'm prepared to grant as a, as a point that all pagans are the same. That's not a broad brush I'm willing to paint with. Yeah. I'm saying, do you grant that when Augustine spoke of two classes of pagans, that was the thing in common, the central crux of his point in that passage in Sermon 198? I don't think that, I, I don't grant that, no. Okay, I would uh, think people should go read it. 
Now, that being said, um, do you believe that only a minority of Christians venerated icons? Only a minority of Christians venerated icons when? All right, well, let's just speak of up to the fourth century. Why not? We got to pick a time where we have enough sources where we could kind of have some lay of the land. All right, so there are probably not most of the art that we have from before the fourth century are either murals or, or statues, not icons. Okay, now my question to you would be, if you're basing this off of archaeology, um, then we do have paintings, we have the murals, like you said, but they're paintings. And are you aware that portraits don't tend to um, be preserved over centuries because they're not as large and they're not painted on indissolvable material like rock? Yes, right. They, they're corruptible material, not incorruptible like God. Well, yes, like the walls. But so let me ask you this. When it comes to a mural, because I think this is something that even Roman Catholics would have the, the same sort of uh, idea that you would have, and I think wrongly personally, which would be why, when what basis is a mural venerated or not venerated according to you? I think it shouldn't be religiously venerated. That's what I've been insisting from the no, beginning. No, but on how would you infer whether it's venerated or not? The context, of course, is what you're going to have to go with Some, in that case. So for as an example from your uh, presentation, when you see a picture of a cross with a man with an ass's head on it, because the context appears to be mocking, it's unlikely that religious veneration is offered to that image, as, just as one example. Well, I would agree with you that being that we have other archaeological evidence that Christians most definitely did not put donkeys on the heads of Christ and their crucifixes, and that uh, Tertullian explicitly denies that they ha we have a donkey-headed God, and, uh, and I think it's actually Lactantius, I forget who else, also mentions the same thing. Um, what, we'd see, what we see that what's in common is that they're talking about a specific practice, uh, which would be venerating the cross. Or do you think that's not something that occurred? I, I think there were a lot of things that occurred. And the veneration of the cross is something that occurred. It does not going to the time of the apostles, but it did occur in uh, the primitive Antinacian church, as evidenced by uh, sources that you, you identified. I think Origen would be an example of that as well. I could be mistaken about that off the top of my head. And so being that the only historical references we have was to the cross being venerated. And on what basis do we presume without any written evidence that it wasn't venerated? I don't, I, we don't think we need to presume that it wasn't venerated. Uh, nothing. Okay. Yeah. My, my and so, so you would concede that the only extant historical evidence we have suggests that the crucifix was venerated. Uh, I think it's you know reading it, inferring one way or the other way is not really necessary. You don't, you don't have to make it. You don't have to come to a conclusion that definitely it was venerated because you don't want to assume that it wasn't. Just for the same reason, why assume that it wasn't? Or, but if we have to make an historical interpretation, which is the job of the historian, what is the safest and most explicit analysis to make based on the extant evidence? Was the crucifix? Uh, venerated by Christians or wasn't it? Well, there's a, well, there's two different things between a, a cross being venerated and the crucifix being venerated. For example, there's a sign of the cross. There isn't a sign of the crucifix, per se, in, in, in the sense of what emotion people make with their hands, just as, a, just as one example. So there is a difference between those two things. And to say that that oh, the, we're, we're talking yeah. about the sources that speak of actual images of crosses and crucifixes. Okay. Because no one talked about venerating their hands doing this. So the question is, if we have the only extant evidence we have is that Christians did venerate these objects, and we have it from both Christians that are mainstream, like Tertullian, and also their critics, like the guy who made the graffito, on what basis do we just presume on the absence of evidence that they weren't venerated? I want to know what that basis is. Oh, why, 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 you might, why you might not assume that? Well, one reason you might not assume that is, is 
because of an absence of teaching, positive, approving teaching by people like Tertullian, that one ought to be venerating the the, the icon of Jesus or something like that. That where is that? It's it's not a it's not a central theme of his. It's not a central theme of any of the pre of the fathers before Nicaea. Uh, and if you find some passing reference to it, uh, it that it's that's one thing. But it's it's quite another to see, think that this is the go from this is a something that was observed or criticized. And so is is what you're contending is that the only legitimate evidence is if we could find a leader contending positively for the practice and not simply evidence that shows that the practice existed. So it has to be a leader, right? Well, I'm not saying that it has to be a leader, but I'm saying that in the same way that we would go about establishing the early practice of infant baptism, if we wanted to establish that, or to try to oppose it, if you're trying to oppose it, we look at the people who talk about it, either approvingly or disapprovingly. And Tertullian is an example of someone who kind of criticizes the practice, observes it, but criticizes it. Does that mean that nobody else was doing it? Does it mean everybody else was doing it? Well, you have to be careful about those assumptions you make, but if you don't I, have I evidence. I agree. Yeah. And so on what basis do we take the arguments of silence based on absences of evidence and take that with greater weight than all the explicit evidence of the positive existence of a practice. I, do, I hope I would hope you wouldn't need to stack things up against each other. I think you could just say we don't know about certain things where we just don't. Because have let's take the issue of baptism. If just to concede the point you were making, if the only evidence we had was that it wasn't being uh, uh, done for infants, and the, all we had were positive teachings that was only believers being baptized, wouldn't that be radically inconsistent with the pedo baptist view? It would be radically inconsistent with a pedo baptist tradition as a universal tradition of the church. That's the And problem. so then on what basis would the aniconist view then be radically inconsistent with the same when the issue of Christian religious images? So if someone were to say it's always been the universal practice of the church that we don't have we don't fall into idolatry we don't worship images that would then the person would be mistaken that's not the, that hasn't been the universal tradition of the church but like many things much of the, some parts and then in some cases much of the church fell into error Now you make the accusation that the painting is not god I want to ask when do Orthodox say that the image of Christ on an icon is God? Well, I've seen icons that say Jesus Christ on written on them. But we don't believe the picture is God. We believe it's a picture of God. Would you can see that? Right. In the same sense that the pagans realize that this isn't really Apollo, this is a statue of Apollo, or this isn't really Diana. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, you say that uh, the painting is not of the divine nature. Uh, my question to you is, how did St. Thomas the Apostle see Christ's divine nature? He did not see Christ's divine nature, but he did see the person. So he saw the person of Christ. And so would it be fair to say that when we make an image of God the Son, that we see the picture of the person, but not of his divine nature? No, because you you don't see either the person or his human nature. You don't even see his human nature when you make a picture. It's just your own imagination or a model. So my question is that little uh, picture used to have, uh, the little comic of Turret and Van that said, go west, Mr. Young Man. Doesn't look exactly like you. It's not a picture of you? That is a picture that was derived of a picture of me, but it... it, it it's a bit different when we're talking about Jesus Christ, because these and are not so, pictures. So, so that why are do we hold the, the the man Jesus Christ to a, a different standard to the man Turton fan? Well, as I was saying, probably I wasn't saying it loud enough, but the pictures that you have, the icons that you have, are not derived by, from people who saw Jesus, or even from people who saw pictures of Jesus that were actually pictures of Jesus. They're just On what basis do you make that argument when Eusebius says since the times of Christ that they were making images and honoring him in that way? 
I deny that Eusebius is accurate in his statement. All right, that's 25 minutes. Oh, wait, no, I got two more minutes. I could keep going. Yeah, you have. We'll get to have more fun, Turretin fan. All right, so your argument then is that the historical evidence we have is not reliable enough. Well, I, I, Eusebius has a somewhat naive picture of history that comes before him. Okay, and so based on the historic evidence that we have, just like our manuscript scriptures, none of them are absolutely perfect. Does that mean then we discount this evidence and infer whatever we want? No, it's just insufficient to ground your views. Okay, and so let me ask about uh, St. Vincent de Lorenz. You speak of how everywhere, always by all, um, is the standard he has, and he say not just a majority. Do you did you know that the context of the statement was over debates over the Council of Ephesus, which had a whole twenty percent of the church that was actually excommunicated at the time, and so the whole basis of that statement was to show why they were right and those people were wrong. Were you aware of that? My understanding is that his primary reference was trying to suggest that Augustinianism was not the universal teaching of the church before Augustine, like a number of uh, folks are trying to do again today. And so on that note that are you aware in the same paragraph, he speaks of the fact that there's sometimes some doctors of the church that aren't part of this consensus. Uh, I would I assume he, he would have in mind Augustine, presumably, in that, if, if my recollection is correct. All right. Well, now I'm officially out of time, so I will end it there. <laughs> there we go. 25 minutes, as usual, with these cross-examination rounds has flown by. So a very engaging first round, and we're now entering the second round. So we've got 25 more minutes. Turretin fan, you get to lead the way in cross-exam for 25 minutes. Again, the floor is yours, gentlemen. Go ahead. In Deuteronomy 4, Moses tells the people of Israel, take you therefore good heed unto yourselves, for you saw no manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you corrupt yourselves and make a grave, graven image. Or is it your contention that this is a prohibition only on the making of pagan idols? Particularly on um, idols, which are, as the scriptures say, um, they're not living. They don't have any prototype behind them. And that's the theological terminology we'd use. And so when there's no image of God that's visible, there'd be no prototype to depict. And same with the pagan idols, a, uh, a statue of Athena, a statue of Zeus, the, you know, the demons that inspire these things aren't Athena or Zeus. So the images are not something that actually represents something real. In Exodus 32, 4, they... Aaron takes the uh, the gold and so I guess it's gold, the jewels of the people of Israel. He receives them at their hand, fashions them with a graving tool, and he made it a molten calf. And he said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Are you contending that the gods which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt is referring to something other than the Lord God? It's an interesting passage in isolation. There's several different possible interpretations. I actually don't have one specific in mind because he said these are the, the gods that brought you out of Egypt. So it may be it's simply the word God, lowercase g, is being used as a sort of synonym for image itself. These are the idols that brought you out of Egypt. So perhaps that's what he means. I've heard a very interesting possibility, um, one which would probably require understanding of Canaanite practice, a lot and good research that needs to be done, that the cows were had nothing on their backs and that the statues of Baal would be riding cows. So it may have been, this is provocative, that the, the calves are supposed to represent by having nothing on their backs, the invisible God itself. So that would be an interesting point in your favor if that is indeed the case. Um, I just don't see actually enough evidence there um, in isolation to scripture 
to really come to a firm conclusion about that, which is precisely why I think St. Vincent is right, that due to the, the multiplicity of interpretations, that we have to hinge ourselves upon the teachers God has given us, which the scriptures say, that's why God has given us teachers in the church. I would love to come back to Vincent in a moment, but before we do that, first Kings 12, 28, talking about Jehu, or sorry, talking about, excuse me, about Jeroboam, says that he took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, meaning to the people of the 10 tribes, it's too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Would you agree that that is, that these calves were supposed to represent the same God that was going to be worshiped in Jerusalem? Again, it would be the same sort of point I was making. Is he speaking of these idols? But I would agree with this. They're not supposed to represent um, some sort of, I don't know, third deity that we are not aware of. They're at least supposed to be connected to Jehovah. I would agree with you. That's my opinion anyway. And would you agree that they're not Baal because of 2 Kings 10, 28, which says Jehu destroyed Baal out of Israel, but that he didn't uh, cease the, the worship or the, the practice of having the golden calves in Bethel and Dan? I mean, yeah, that sounds sensible. Why not? When Jesus was uh, approached by the Samaritan woman who asked her, uh, she asked him whether they should worship in Samaria or Jerusalem. Uh, and he su he uh, suggested that there, there was coming a time when there'd be worshiping in neither place and said that God is a spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What's the connection between God being a spirit and having this spirit and truthful worship versus having worship centered on Jerusalem? Well, to get an actual real profound answer to that question is because with the coming of Christ, the veil, the curtain is torn in two. We have a priesthood of all believers that we all have access to. It includes the laity and those who preside over the liturgy. That's why in Orthodox worship, we have a curtain that's opened and when we get to commune of God's flesh and blood. So we would see this as a, a liturgical reference to the priesthood of all believers that exist in the Orthodox Church. So is there any connection between the fact that God is a spirit and the destruction of a Jerusalem-centered worship? Just based upon, I think it's not so much uh, any given geography that the idea that, that you have a priesthood that isn't of all believers, that you have a Levitical priesthood that's hereditary, that the common man doesn't have access to. And so I think that is, and with the Samaritans, because uh, racially speaking, they can never be part of. And so I think it actually accords with exactly what I just said. And that's, that's why the Orthodox Church is this church that proceeds from what Christ was saying. Would you agree that the Samaritan religion, as described uh, by the Old Testament, was a worship of the Lord, a corrupt worship of the Lord? Well, in the Old Testament, after the fall of Jerusalem, it does make mention of Samaritans at that time in the sixth century that, uh, if I remember right, they sliced and diced themselves. And so they had incorporated other pagan practices. However, that's not strictly true of the Samaritans of the, of the day that uh, Jesus is speaking of. Um, they may have the same ethnic stock, but since the Maccabees, there's even, I think, the Idumeans, if I remember the name of uh, the ethnicity right, there were people that they literally conquered and forcibly converted to Judaism, and they essentially became Jews. And so, yes, they had worship. We still exist today, though it's very tiny, um, of Samaritans. That's pretty much Jewish in all respects, but it's just, it's focused, um, it's focused in what's it, Mount, uh, whatever that other mount they have there. Um, interestingly enough, one of the things that are in common is they kiss mezuzahs, is like Jews kiss mezuzahs, which means the kissing of mezuzahs, that veneration practice, actually must precede, um, must precede Christianity because it's something that these different sects of Jews have in common. In uh, in Second Kings, the king of Assyria, uh, after the uh, after he took all the ten tribes out of the land, he he observed lions coming into the land and destroying them, and he sent back a priest of the uh, a priest of the line that that had been set up by Jeroboam 
to teach them. Do you agree that that's the ancestry, the religious ancestry of the Samaritan re religion, or you have a different view from that? I mean, I think there's more to it, being the fact that they took flat out foreigners and settled them there and they intermarried. Uh, I think that sort of syncretism plays part in the origins. But I think these strings of inferences are a far cry from a, an explicit denial, the veneration of anything created, the religious context and the other distinctions that you're making. Thank you for redirecting us back to the main question here. And coming to Paul in Acts 17, when he was on Mars Hill, after acknowledging that they have a, 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 an altar to the unknown God and saying that they ignorantly worship uh, this God, he, he just says in Acts 17, 25, that God is ni neither is worshipped with man's hands as though he needed anything. Do you agree that that's a reference to making images? Well, particularly pagan images. That's what the context is about. So did Paul have a, a, an, a, a, a statue or icon of Jesus Christ to show them instead of their statue of Diana or somebody else? It's very possible he did. Galatians chapter 3 says that uh, Christ was portrayed to them crucified. It's certainly possible. Okay. Is it, is it we have absolute certainty? No. I don't know. But it's certainly possible. One thing I can say is this reading these texts is that when we see them condemning images and their use of images, it's interesting that the author is doing that will in another context accept the use of images or uh, other things attached to those pagan practices in a Christian context. So I think it's an overly reductionist and actually inaccurate and out of context go, well, because they don't like this pagan image, that therefore equals a disallowance for all, Im all images of Christ and the saints. Um, it's presumed upon. And I think without that presumption, it's just, it's just not there. When you refer to Galatians 3, I suppose you're referring to this verse, which says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Uh, are, are you denying that that's a reference to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper? It could be to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. It could be disfigurative about his uh, speaking. It could be about an icon. How do you discern between one and the other in isolation? With, well, with That's the only evidence you have. What if we come back to Acts 19 and we look at Demetrius the silversmith raising this mob up against Paul because he's concerned that Paul, Paul about Paul's teaching that there are these are no gods which are made with hands. Is that doesn't Demetrius understand that Paul's religion is anti uh, anti representational? His understanding it's anti representational of the wear that he's selling certainly. So he's selling he, pagan idols. So if he's if he saw that Paul was walking around with a, a golden statue of Jesus or a silver statue of Jesus, would he have the same concern? Well, I'm an Orthodox Christian, so I think he probably wasn't walking around with statues. <laughs> but right. that being that being said, it reminds me of a, a, a early text from Saint Hippolytus in Apostolic Traditions. He talks about well, what do we do with those four former pagan makers, uh, idol makers rather? Um, what do we do with these former idol makers? And he says, well, let them be taught to do something else. Well, taught what? Maybe to make Christian images. But is all we know here, all we all know here in Acts chapter 19 is we have someone making pagan idols. That's his job. And because we have someone converting people to a religion that doesn't use those pagan idols, that gives them reason to be dissatisfied. There's no indication that, oh, well, I could convert to Christianity and I could start making things. You're just... There's nothing there to text about that. It's just he's a pagan that makes pagan idols, and that's what it's surrounding. That's the context of it. Now, you mentioned that because you're Orthodox, you don't have you know a silver or gold statue of Jesus. And I appreciate that distinction between Orthodox and Roman Catholic positions. On the other hand, you referred to Eusebius talking about a statue of the Good Shepherd, mm -hmm. uh, as though that's evidence of something that supports your position. Yep. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you connect those two dots? That, that's, it's not that's, to be that's, a very, that's a very good question. This may explain or be part of the explanation of why Eusebius isn't really all down with it. I think that there's a difference between orthopraxy and orthodoxy. Orthopraxy is how we practice religion and how it looks, and orthodoxy is 
doctrinal. And so when I'm making the case for iconodulia, I'm going to speak about what proves the doctrine. Now, I don't think I could prove via orthopraxy that statues, you know, like Eusebius, would be something, unless perhaps they were more two-dimensional two like reliefs, like crucifixes, um, would be something people are comfortable with venerating. And I just want to make an appeal to people's guts, right? Which is why this works, because we're human beings and Christ uh, Christ is came as a man. It was the word made flesh, which is I wouldn't want to, you know, show affection to a statue of my son, like, you know, or a statue of my wife. But I got no problem kissing a picture of them, right? And so I think those sensibilities are my conscious affirming orthodox orthopraxy. And I think almost everyone, if not everybody listening to this right now, Orthodox, Protestant, Roman Catholic, would agree with me 100% they feel exactly the same way. So isn't that your conscious bearing witness to the orthodox orthopraxy? I think that's extremely compelling. So the actual position as defined by the Seventh Ecumenical Council is not that it's just okay to kiss people's pictures, but that there's anathema to those who do not salute the holy and venerable images, correct? Absolutely. And by anathema, according to the documents of that council, anathema is nothing less than complete separation from God. Yes. So this is not a matter of, you know, some people feel like, oh, they like to kissing the pictures of their wife or their daughter or something like that. And, you know, if you like to do it and if you don't, you know, don't. This is, you have to do it. You have to because it's a Christological heresy not to. You could go to hell if you don't. So, and yet the scripture you pointed us to was Galatians 3, which then when we asked you what it means, it you said that it could be this or it could be that. You're not... Yeah, uh, and then the other one was Psalm ninety nine five, which she said, "Exalt," which says, "Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at His footstool, for He is holy." Now, I worship you, His footstool, not at, but yeah. What's your basis for saying that it's worship His footstool, not worship at His footstool? Original languages, there's no word at. Look at the Hebrew. Look at the Greek. Okay, and uh, which is the original language, Hebrew or Greek? Well, the being that they both agree, it just verifies that we don't have a corruption in the Masoretic tradition, that it's accurate. So I, I presume you're the same way, like with biblical criticism, we, we give generally a priority to certain tradition, but we use the other traditions to verify that um, what we have is fundamentally accurate. So the fact they both agree shows they're fundamentally accurate. But do you... Uh, I'm looking at English translations of the text, and I'm not seeing a lot that disagree that agree with your point. Well, but, that's why we need to look at the original languages and not what Protestant sectarians translate it to be. If you will look, if you go to BibleHub.com and look at the interlinear, um, you'll see um, worship his footstool. At the Bible Hub interlinear, we'll say worship his footstool. I want to make sure I got the right verse, by the way, because if I got the wrong verse, then I'm going to be leaving in the wrong place. And that I would apologize. So being that we're looking at, oh, and, and let me ask you this. If I show you from the scripture what I'm saying is accurate, will you then um, affirm Iconodulia? I will... Because then what's the point of us what's the point of us looking this up then? Well, you're the one who's suggesting that there's any I'm sorry, I shouldn't be asking questions. You, right. You're the one asking questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. But no, I, I think if you establish iconodulia from scripture, then you establish it and we should all accept it. But the the idea that Psalm ninety nine five says we worship God's footstool, uh in I, I it seems to represent not just a fundamental mistranslation of the text but also a misunderstanding of the whole point of what it means to worship at his footstool means to bow down to at below his feet, to, to bow to God. And the footstool is just the referenced because that's the place where God's feet would be. And it's an anthropomorphism because God doesn't actually have feet, certainly not at the time when Psalm 99.5 was written. Uh, so that's yeah, my... I, d I, I just want people to be aware because that didn't sound like a question, but I'll try to answer it. Yeah. When you look at BibleHub.com, 
it's going to look inaccurate. It's going to say in the Hebrew, exalt Yahweh God, worship at his footstool holy he is. And people are going to say, oh, look, Craig is wrong. He's misleading me. Click on the Hebrew text and see what the word at is. You're going to see one is foot, the other is like stool. It's saying footstool. And so people could translate the word at, but that word used in the rest of the Hebrew scriptures does never means at. That's not what the word means. And that's why the Septuagint translator was aware of that and doesn't have the word at. And so being that this scripture positively contains what I'm saying, it shows that I at least have a scripture that shows we have a material object that's paid veneration, which would have, uh, at, at, it's in some ways very radical. They actually had sacrifices towards this thing. And I think then this shows, well, if we actually show we could pay veneration to the, inv the image of the invisible God, because that's the point of the Ark of the Covenant, that's why the angels are looking at something invisible, then this shows a consistency with when Christ is made flesh that we could venerate the, depict the depictions of the visible God. You appeal to the Septuagint, but the New English translation of the Septuagint uh, says for Psalm 98, Septuagint Psalm 98, our Psalm 99, says, exalt the Lord our God and do obeisance at the footstool of his feet, because holy is he. So again, I, is again, this I'm because not, uh, uh, there's a lot of You want me to actually word? read the Greek? <laughs> I mean, again, it's, it's when you go word by word in the language, not the inferences, which are incorrect, made by certain translators. The literal translation is what I say. Anyone can look at it in the linear. Uh, so it's your position that anyone with an interlinear would be a better source than the translators of the Septuagint? That's a, that, that's an appeal to authority, which is a logical fallacy. It's yeah. very basic. It if is. We have, if we have a word and its, and its definition is never at, it's the word foot, then right. when they add the word at, that's an inference to the translator. It's not actually the word. You could look up that word in a dictionary. You could look up that word and it's every single usage, thanks to technology, and the rest of scriptures in that text type. And so that is my point. And so when this is verified in the literal languages, when you look at it, then this to me shows that the inference of translators, because oftentimes they're just basing it upon some other English translation when they're doing it. That's a very common practice. That is an error. That's why, for example, in any debate that's been on this channel, people are all the time making appeals to the original language because if you could just appeal to a translation, that would settle it. Ironically, I've done a number of King James Version debates on this channel with folks who are quite happy to just rely on the King James translation. But here, the, it's not a, it, would you agree with me that it's not an invalid appeal to authority about a question that the authorities are competent? to answer. I think it's uh, an appeal to authority because I can look at the words right now and the word at is not there in the original languages. And anyone watching this could go to Psalm 99.5 on Bible Hub and they could go to uh, en.katabiblon.com and they could look the same up in the Septuagint and they could see it themselves and they could click and look at every other usage. And it's pretty strange if in every other usage it's ever used, the word at is missing. But just there, it somehow magically has the word at. I wonder how that is. <laughs> so uh, when it comes to scripture in general, we need this rule of Vincent where it has to be the way that's done by everyone at always and everywhere. But when I actually do that with by looking at all the translations everywhere, always, by everyone, and they all agree with the position I've just expressed, you're willing to stand alone against all of them on the on Sola Scriptura, but which really is solo scriptura right here. <laughs> Turn to fan, you're awesome. I'll just say this. I think we would agree that the English language translations lack antiquity. <laughs> Which is part of St. Vincent's criteria. <laughs> Just had to say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> do do any of the fathers do, do any of the fathers before the Seventh Ecumenical Council interpret this worship at a footstool in any of the Psalms commentaries before the Seventh Ecumenical Council? Do they that, ever interpret it this way? That is actually an excellent question. I think there's a misnomer that, and because Orthodox will even think this. That a passage of scripture, because we believe in a consensus of doctrine, that means there's a consensus. Every passage must have a consensus among the saints for its interpretation for you to be firm in its interpretation. However, I would cite St. Maximus that says that there's an infinite amount of interpretations for each passage. And so if we were to accept that, 
then it really wouldn't matter if I have a consensus for that. The consensus is on the apostolic deposit of faith. It's that we have agreement on doctrine, not that we agree on every point of how to apply each passage of scripture. I think actually God blesses us with the spirit to, to, to dive deeper and deeper into scripture and to get other aspects from that scripture. Um, which is why, for example, in Isaiah chapter 7, I don't doubt there's an immediate fulfillment in the birth of a son to, uh, to a king, but its true significance, we only found out in the birth of Christ, that the virgin would give birth, right, to Jesus Christ. And so scriptures could have multiple meanings, and that's, that's really not an issue here. I don't need to ap uh, appeal to a consensus on a specific passage for that passage to say what it clearly says. But I could see where you would make a uh, have that sort of confusion because there's orthodox that have that sort of confusion. I mean, I kind of think that it's clear when everybody agrees, but coming to Augustine's interpretation of this text, he says, and fall down before his footstool for he is holy. What are we to fall down before his footstool? What is under his feet is called a footstool. And then he asks the question about, I don't know, a few lines down. He says, how then uh, shall we worship the earth? When the scripture says openly, you shall worship the Lord your God. And he continues on and he says, we have found out now, he says, we have found out in what sense such a footstool of our Lord's may be worshipped. And not only that we sin in not worshipping it, but that we sin, or that we, we sin not in worshipping it, but that we sin in not worshipping it. And can you guess what Augustine's answer is, having for your familiarity with Augustine, if, you, if you're not already, uh, if you don't already remember this interpretation? I'm going to say, I can, I'm not going to guess, but because that's a question, I'm going to say what's the answer. But being that, I will answer this way. I'll say with St. Augustine, there's so much more there. I would love to talk about it. I could talk, I'll talk about this in another context of the time because we're out of time. And to finish up my answer, you go look at Young's literal translation of Psalm 99.5, which prides itself in being very literal. And you'll see it accords with exactly what I tell you Psalm 99.5 says. Okay. And when Augustine interprets this as worshiping Jesus, and he doesn't mention anything about icons or anything else, is that consistent with Vincent of Lorenz everywhere, always, by all view? It, it, again, it sounds to me that he's trying to draw an application that makes sense given the audience he's giving the sermon to. And so, for example, when he says, well, are we bowing down and worshiping the ground and stuff? There's a subtle anti-Judaism there because that's not his audience and it's not very relevant. And so I think you're kind of missing out on the pastor application, and it's not relevant to the question you're asking. Gentlemen, that is 25 minutes, and that concludes the 50-minute cross-exam. Great job to the both of you. A really fantastic back and forth and easy to moderate. So you both gave me an easy debate to moderate on this uh, Friday night. So we do still have closing statements where we can wrap up our thoughts, wrap up our points. And then we have an audience Q&A uh, with many fantastic questions. So with that, Craig, we are going to give you the floor again. And whenever you're ready, I'll start your timer. You got five minutes. Go ahead. I want to actually sincerely thank Turretin Fan. I thought the way he handled this debate was actually brilliant because as a debater, you don't want to have the debate on the battleground which the other guy is prepared. And so it's like, I'm going to go bring it over here to the scripture side and totally not talk about the tradition side. And that was wise because, to be honest, it made it where we put the debate more in his direction and not in mine. And I think that that shows the tactfulness of Turretin fan in this debate. Now, I would say despite that brilliant move as a debater, someone who he has been doing this for many, many more years than I have been, I think it shows you the weakness of the Aniconist case and the case against Iconodulia that even doing that, he really couldn't make a positive case for what he was claiming. His, his case does not exist in tradition. He didn't even bother to make it exist in tradition. It doesn't exist in scripture. He could give you all sorts of scriptures about why pagan idols are bad. He can make all sorts of presumptions based on uh, why um, they somehow relate to the veneration images. He can make these crypto and historian statements, which are really inconsistent, but he cannot show the case that the scriptures ever say we can't venerate icons. In fact, when he's uh, brought, uh, posed with the positive evidence that we actually have a scripture that says we're venerating this object, the response is, well, can't really be saying that. <laughs> and I think 
being that this this is a reduction of debate, I just commend the audience. Go look it up yourself. Look at what I'm saying. Look at the most literal translations. Look at the interlinears. Go ask scholars that are translated. Go if you were to do it really literally. Ask ChatGPT. I don't care if you're to be exactly literal, word for word. Is the word at there? And they're going to say no. And so, what's this reduce this debate to? It reduces it to that if the being that this is not a topic the scriptures dwell upon, just like they don't dwell upon whether it's believers' baptism or infant baptisms and things that are very important to Christians, they divide over these things. So just because the scriptures don't dwell on it doesn't mean it's not important. But the only scriptures that even talk about it are in my favor. You have to interpret them as not. The scriptures that the Anaconist side dwell upon have nothing to do with Christian images. They have everything to do with pagan idols. When they cite the second commandment, they never cite it literally that it's about all literal created things because they can't because it talks about the creation of cherubim. That's why we can depict things that are depictable. That's the point. You can't depict pagan idols. You don't want to, one, because we don't worship them, we don't venerate them, we don't respect them, but two, they don't even exist. They're not real. That's something that's all throughout the scriptures that they don't exist. Interesting, something that never came up in Turt and fans at, at all during this debate. And that's one like the central criteria of all those critiques is that these are dead images with no life in them and that they're, they're nothing, right? That, that's the whole basis of the critique. It's because they have no prototypes. There is no Athena. There is no Zeus. There's just demons tricking people to believe in these things. But there is, there are no pagans. Uh, there are no pagan gods. They're not real. All right. There's no gods of Egypt. They're demons tricking people to worship them instead of worshiping the true God. That's the point. And so when you have a case that's predicated upon a presupposition with no explicit evidence, with inferences, like I said in my opening statement, the side that will win will be the side making the less inferences. Who is the side that has explicit scriptures that explicitly contain what is their doctrine? Not turds and fan, the orthodox side. What side has a sacred tradition in every instance in which the uh, issue of Christian religious art is brought up? It talks about one, it exists, and two, it's venerated. It doesn't matter because you go, oh, well, a Gnostic they wrote it against Gnostics. But what about the Gnostic that wrote it against other people? Wouldn't that contradict each other? Because the point is, you can't say, well, it's a, we can't disallow this evidence because, again, it's about Gnostics. And then, well, we can't use this because a Gnostic wrote it and it's against other people. Right. That's a methodological contradiction. And so I would point to people go look at Irenaeus. Where does he condemn Christian religious art and the crowning of it? He does it. In fact, he condemns other modes. Right? Why does he make that differentiation? Because it was the pagan practices. I challenge you this. You guys are going to go to quote minds after this from Dr. Gavin Ort, Loon, Lynn Martin, and all the other ones that are out there. They're always about pagan images. And when you read those same authors in other contexts, they will say, oh, there's no pagan altars. There's no, no pagan temple. There's no Christian temples. There's no Christian altars. These are polemical extremes about pagan practices. They will admit in other passages that there's Christian analogs. And so that's why we got to understand scriptures in the context of the saints, because they're the ones that have preserved and written the scriptures for us. They didn't beam down from heaven. They're preserved by God's people in the church. The consensus of the saints matters. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Craig, for that five minute concluding statement. Much appreciated. Uh, church and fan, we're going to hand it over to you now for your five minute concluding statement. Go ahead. Thanks so much. I will certainly concede the point that there is, I apologize, my timer is off. Here we go. I certainly concede the point that there's a lot of evidence in church history of people falling into idolatry, whether it's the people of Israel in the Old Testament time period or People in the New Testament time, not in this time of scripture per se, that's not uh, something that's mentioned that, that Christians fell into this in that time period, but it was certainly enough of a risk that they would do so that John wrote, little children, keep yourselves from idols. It is true that they're, one of the problems with idols is that they represent nothing. And that's true even of the idols that are found in Orthodox and Roman Catholic churches whether you distinguish between those two 
or you don't. Neither of them represent, shows you an actual picture of what Jesus actually looked like. There's just someone's imagination or a model. It's, there's, there's no reliable evidence that this is the, how Jesus looked. And it's an odd thing, therefore, to say that, to put the name Jesus Christ underneath as though it is him. It isn't. It's not even a picture of him. It's just a picture that's supposed to represent him. And yet this picture is now being offered religious veneration, contrary to what was just explicitly said multiple times in Scripture. I didn't have time to read all of them. Deuteronomy 4, 15 is a great example of a place where the prohibition is not only against pagan idols, but also against making any images of the Lord. The Lord who had been seen by Jacob, who had been seen by Abraham. Uh, Moses saw the backside of the Lord, according to Scripture. Then people have... Had, there are theophanies in scripture, and yet in the Old Testament, pictures of God were forbidden. And that, that prohibition was not lifted in the New Testament just because Jesus came. Paul does, there, the script, New Testament scriptures don't describe making and worshiping images, you know, venerating them, whatever term you want to use. The, it's not mentioned, it's not described, it's not endorsed. Scripture does not teach us to worship God this way. Where did it come from? Well, it comes from the pagans. That's where it has always come from. That's where it came It came from in the New Testament time period. That's why people fell into it. That's the fact that the Seventh Ecumenical Council says that we should do this isn't enough, not only because it's not traditional in the sense that just 30 years before, there was a significant council that discussed it and Craig disputed that point. He said it's not that big, it's not ecumenical, and so forth. But it did exist. It did have, apparently, hundreds of bishops there. And when we look at the church fathers, we're told, well, the scripture is insufficient in the sense that we need to have it informed by tradition. But when we read the writings, the traditional, the writings that are found in this tradition, we don't see before Nicaea, we don't see uh, praise of the use of religious uh, 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 icons or similar structures. We do see the, con the some small debate, some little thing on the side, but no command. You need to make sure to venerate these holy images. That's not something that's uh, argued for by any of these early church fathers. And when it comes to the very proof texts that were offered as the places that the scriptures supposedly teach this, Look for yourselves. Look what the fathers actually say about these verses. Since we said we should interpret scripture no other way than it has always been interpreted by everyone always. If you start interpreting them as referring to the use, the support for the veneration of images, this worship at his footstool, even if it said worship his footstool, the interpretation of the fathers is going to point you towards Christ, worshiping Christ. They're not, it's not going to point you towards worshiping an image. The same thing when it says he was evidently set forth before you. Where do you think that's going to point you in the fathers? Look, if you don't, if you think that it's pointing you towards images or icons, I don't think you'll find it. It's not enough to try to justify that we can find old pictures, we can find old statues dating back, sometimes with a provenance that we can trust, sometimes with a provenance we can't trust. The fact that we see graffiti that's mocking Christianity just shows us that not everyone who painted pictures in that time period were believers. But rather than trust graffiti, maybe we should trust the, the writings of Holy Scripture, which teach us, little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Thank you very much, church and fan, for that five-minute concluding statement. Gentlemen, that concludes the concluding statement. So we've made it to the end of the debate before the audience Q&A, that is. So, <laughs> Craig, great endurance. Hard to believe we've been going at this for two hours. I feel like we were just sitting back and having a conversation in the pre-show. So fantastic job to the both of you. Great, uh, great job in preparing for this debate. You really made for a debate to remember. I've really enjoyed this. And I feel like I've learned a lot on this topic. You gentlemen really know your stuff. So with that, uh, to the audience, what we're going to do is jump right into audience questions. 
I'll have about 15 or 20 minutes of reminders and announcements. Uh, we have a lot going on on the channel for the summer, but I will, uh, I'll go over all those reminders and announcements after the audience Q and A when Craig and uh, Turret and Fan leave for the night. So with that gentlemen, let's get to some audience questions. We'll do about 25 minutes. Craig, since it's your first time here on the, on the channel, what we typically do is whoever the question's for obviously gets the first response. And then uh, let's say the question's for you, Craig, you respond. Turretin fan can give his response as well, but then we'd give you the last word. So whoever the question's for basically gets the last word. That way we can uh, move along smoothly. All right. Okay. All right. We'll start right at the beginning. And okay, here we go. First question that came in from Nakia Boyer. Appreciate the question. Question for Craig. Since praising, worshiping, or making idols of things in heaven or earth is judged so severely, can you exegete a verse where God explains how and when it's permissible to bow to idols? I think we're all in agreement that the scriptures are against the bowing of pagan idols. That's my answer. <laughs> All right, awesome. Craig, appreciate it. Short and sweet. Turton fan, floor is yours if you had a response. It's helpful if I unmute myself first. Yeah. <laughs> in in 2 Kings 5.18, and I alluded to this in the debate, in 2 Kings 5.18 it says, uh, Naaman is talking to the prophet of the Lord, and he says, In this thing the Lord pardon thy servant, that when my master goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and when he leans on my hand and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, when I bow down myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon thy servant in this thing. And he said unto him, go in peace. So he departed from him a little way. So I think that's an example of when there's not a religious intent to the bowing, that there's uh, there's a difference between the bowing in the house of Rimmon. Of course, I'm inferring uh, that there's an idol there because that's uh, what one would expect. I would just, being that I get a last word, I'd say two things, which would be, that's an interesting allowance that's made there. And I'd want to be careful of that because St. Paul in 1 uh, Corinthians 10, if I remember right, uh, when it comes to the, the meat uh, sacrifice to idols, you know, when you're eating the meat, when you don't know about it, it's okay. You may do it because it affects no one's conscience. And then if um, you're eating the meat and they say, well, sacrifice to idols, then you're not to eat the meat, but for their conscience sake. And so this implies to me actually that this sort of uh, division of like, oh, well, it's, it's, you could eat pagan meat because uh, it's not part of, of the worship or something. It's, I just don't think that's exactly the sort of uh, distinctions that St. Paul is making. And I, I just say my comment on the question is like, well, you know, how can he explain the uh, that Orthodox is idolatrous when you pray to idol? It's like it's kind of like question begging a little bit. So that's that's why my answer was so short and sweet in the beginning. Awesome. Thank you very much, Craig, for the final word on that question. Okay, moving on. Question now from Jacob Emmanuel. Question for Turretin. Do you think an illustrated children's book depicting the life of Christ is idolatrous? Well, I will say, I'll, first of all, I will point out that there are such children's books designed by Reformed artists that fail to illustrate Christ, even while d describing the life of Christ. Uh, so that's possible to do that. But I assume for the sake of this question that Jacob has in mind, one that actually shows a picture purporting to be of Christ. And while I object to it, I don't object as strongly to that as to then treating this picture with uh, religious veneration. For example, put framing it, putting candles in front of it, crowning it with wreaths, uh, kissing it, saluting it. That, that, that's where I have a problem. Now, I do have a, I would have an issue if someone was going to make this picture, say that it's supposed to picture Jesus and then treat it disrespectfully as well. That's also problematic. It's not problematic in the sense that I just described, of observing religious veneration, but instead it would be kind of like taking the Lord's name in vain. 
by uh, by act like this uh, uh, crucifix painting that has a ass's head on a man. That's that's also irreverent, but for and it's problematic for different reasons. I think that's a very interesting answer to the question because I think it reveals that the the meat of the opposition to iconodulia is really just what people are acculturated with and they're not used to certain methods of orthopraxy. Because, right, if we were literalist with the scriptural case that was given in this debate, then it should have been absolutely cannot have those images and just like you destroy any other pagan image, you destroy that image. But that's not the answer we're given because we're awash with the, the beginner's Bible and other, you know, great content for kids and, and other such things. And so... I think the, the issue is like Orthodox kisses icon, ooh, eared, ucky, that's not what I'm used to seeing. That's all foreign. You know, Anglicans kiss the cross in Good Friday. Oh, okay. Anglican priest looks towards the cross when praying. Oh, okay. You know, a crucifix, by the way, there's an image of Christ on it. Um, even crucifixes seem to have a little bit more of allowance, though, depending on the Protestant. Um, it's just not as bad somehow because it's just what they're culturally used to. And we have to remember Christianity is a religion from a Semitic, it started among a Semitic people, totally other part of the world, speaking totally other language uh, millennia ago. To expect it to meet the cultural norms you're used to is kind of foolish, and it's not a good measure of what's good and what's bad. And I think that's why the Protestants are so inconsistent on this issue, because they're culturally, geographically, and chronologically separated from the church. Thank you, Craig. And Turretin, this question was for you, so you get the last word. I think it's healthy for us to allow scripture to form our culture and rather than to just adopt the culture that's around us. This culture of kissing representations predates uh, orthodoxy and uh, other uh, views. Hosea describes it in Hosea 13 too, where it says that now they sin more and more and have made them molten images of their silver and idols according to their own understanding, all of it the work of the craftsmen. They say of them, let the men that sacrifice kiss the calves. Okay, appreciate it, uh, Turchin fan. Okay, so we'll go with, looks like Jacob Emmanuel, another question from Jacob, this time for you, Craig. So Jacob's asking, how do you respond if someone says they agree with your Christology, but their conscience still won't allow them to bow down to icons. It's again, and just so people know, bowing is not a very common pra uh, practice with icons, though it's it's allowable, and I personally am in favor of it. There's Russian saints that do it, and etc. But I would say it's because people know that the Orthodox have the correct Christological doctrines. People know it. And so they don't want to say, oh, well, I dispute the Sixth Council and I don't agree with what it says, even though they have no idea what any of it means. They just, it just feels wrong to them to say that it's wrong. But the reality is they don't actually believe what our doctrines believe. Otherwise, it would compel them to venerate the icons. Um, I, that's why I brought up during this debate that a lot of the things we heard were an historian and inconsistent. Um, they, they apply to cultural norms and, and, and not to... Just look at these things dispassionately and according to what the doctrine, how the doctrine inform our practice. And I think that's why. It's because someone says, I agree with the Christology, but my conscience don't feel right. It's because in reality, it's sometimes our mind is somewhere different where our heart is. It's like saying, you know, um, I know I love my wife, but my heart is enamored with other women. Perish the thought, right? And so what we need is the mind and the heart in the same place. Thank you, Craig. Turretin, floor is yours. I suppose my my answer is uh, I, I think what, what it, both sides in the in the uh, debate at the time of the Seventh Ecumenical Council, both sides of the debate accused the other side of being Nestorian, and their arguments are interesting. It's not something that's just new to this century that people make that kind of argument. But ultimately, the problem for me is that scripture is fairly unequivocal that we are not to make images of God and not to bow down to them. And then to insist that someone must not only can or may, but must do so is it should be shocking 
to the conscience of those who have read scripture and found no such instruction. Okay, thank uh, you, Turton. Craig, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my simple, my simple response would be: this again shows that we go back to the second commandment, but we don't apply the second commandment consistently, and the inconsistency, I think, betrays other more profound theological errors. Okay, thank you, Craig, for that final word. All right, moving on here. Question from Uncensored Pilgrims. Another question for you, Craig. What is the purpose of icon veneration? And where do you find any precedent for this practice in the New Testament? All right, like I said, it's kind of like a goalpost thing because now we are only the New Testament. Like we already cited the passage Galatians, which could be very well applying to the practice that uh, to the Galatians that uh, St. Paul portrayed to them Christ crucified. And we know the existence of early crucifixes. Um, but the purpose of icon veneration ultimately is to inform our prayer life. That's why the scriptures have prostrations, standing in prayer, praying towards a certain direction. That's why they have certain prayer orthopraxy, like the pray without ceasing. That's why the scriptures have fasting. Um, these things who are inform our spirituality, because we're not disembodied spirits. We're not just minds in outer space. We are both soul and body. And so what we do with our body actually informs our entire uh, worship, veneration, our heart, our closeness to God. And we're, and that's the name of the game, is to be faithful to God and to grow in faith and to persevere in that faith. And icons are part of this. Okay, thank you, Craig. Turretin, floor is yours. I would invite anyone to read Galatians 3.1 and see if there's there any reference to icons or if the context immediately goes to talking about the faith in Jesus Christ and receiving the spirit and so forth. But I think Craig's point about the way that orthodoxy and orthopraxy inform each other, or should, but in fact they do often do, I think it provides an interesting way in which one could argue that the silence in the writings of those early centuries on this topic suggests an absence of practice on the same point. Rather than arguing from the, the, the grotto paintings, one could argue from the writings and suggest uh, that it, this should be a two-way street. My response is I had four anti-Nicene writings. I had three anti-Nicene um, archaeological proofs, actually four if you get into the other, four or five if you get into the other crucifixes. We have several more from the fourth century, which shows continuity with the earlier centuries. And we have zero references uh, whatsoever, which would be positively not allowing for the veneration of these images. And so the only consistent um, interpretation, historical evidence I could make is that orthopraxy was the veneration of icons. All right. Thank you for the final word there, Craig. And next question comes in for Turretin fan. This one's from Jared Jones. How would Turretin fan explain Joshua and the elders bowing before the Ark of the Covenant in Joshua 7, 6? Also, King Nebuchadnezzar bows to Daniel in honor of God in Daniel 2. So on the Joshua 7, 6, the Ark of the Lord represented a localized presence of God. There's a space above the mercy seat it's an empty space and when someone's bowing before the ark it, it's not that they're bowing to the ark itself but they're, they're intending to bow to, to god as for nebuchadnezzar bowing to daniel i i need to i need to double check the uh the scripture i don't i don't recall the exact thing and i apologize i just don't have it in my fingertips uh, so i would I, was it, I think it was after Daniel escaped from the lion's den that he came to him and threw himself at his feet. I can't, I can't remember which uh, event. Maybe Craig has it at, at hand, but uh, I'll, I don't want to just kind of go on while I search for the passage. Uh, rather, Yeah, I would, I would just respond briefly that they're bowing to what the Ark represents, which is the invisible God. It's his footstool. Um, and which makes it a holy object. And Orthodox also venerate holy objects, why we kiss the chalice, um, 
you know, because again, it's like his footstool, he's present in the chalice because we believe in the real presence of Christ and and the uh, in what it is bread and wine, but it becomes Christ's flesh and blood. But um, otherwise, I think these other instances of bowing, um, Daniel bows to an angel, for example. Um, you know, it's we just we pay honor in all different contexts in different ways, and the context determines it. Here's a very good example. You've been to a Protestant church, especially if you're like Baptist or like the more low church stuff, and it's the picture of the woman in the air with their hands or the guy in their hands toward, you know, with the sun rising. You know, it's supposed to be they're praising God. But if we're in a pagan context, it looks like they're praying to the sun. But we know that's not the point. <laughs> we know they're not praying to the sun. They're praising God. And so very often context informs what the veneration practice really means. And I think uh, we just have to be honest with ourselves. The Orthodox, just ask any normal Orthodox Christian, they know they're not worshiping an icon. I mean, it feels like that to you, it looks like that to you, but if, it don't, if that's not true for their context, on what basis do you say, well, then they're idolaters, but then not point to yourselves or being sun worshipers, right? It's just, we gotta be adults here, you know, context informs this sort of veneration that's shown the people, the objects, all different things. Thank you, Craig. Turretin, did you want the last word? So on the question of whether or not it's worship, it's a religious veneration. The, the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which is the one that defines all of this, uses the Greek word for pros, this proskuneo verb, which is the same verb that the devil used to describe what he wanted Jesus to do to him. And it's one of the words that's used in the Septuagint to translate bowing down and worshiping in all of the, in, in at least a, a chunk of the texts. I have the whole, a bunch of them in front of me in case that was to come up during the debate. Uh, I finally found the Daniel passage, uh, which is Daniel 2, 46. The, uh, th so this is right after Daniel has explained the dream to Nebuchadnezzar. And it says, the King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshiped Daniel and commended that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. Uh, so uh, I, I simply that doesn't sound right. that. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. And I don't, I was going to say, I think, uh, I was about to say, I think Craig also wouldn't endorse that. Though, though I'm happy Nebuchadnezzar repented, right? Isn't that chapter four? He, right, he become like he's in the wilderness and all that, and he, he praises the true God. So he's a character of, it's, I love the story of his repentance. So I hope that answers Jared's question ultimately on the second part. <laughs> Gentlemen, I appreciate the answers from the both of you. So here we go. Next question comes in from the other Paul. Thank you for your question. Question for Craig. Augustine uh, explained, I guess, Psalm 115, speaks against the idea that Christians pray through images on liturgical or liturgical instruments to God, does this speak against iconulic reasoning? I probably butchered that last word. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. You guys are in for a treat. I'm going to read the passage. It's paragraph 6 of 7, exposition of Psalm 115. A cousin says, I neither worship an idol nor a devil, but a bodily image. They reply, that's the pagans, that they worship not the bodies themselves, but the deities which preside over the government of them. It will be said by the pagans, we also, that is the Christians, have many instruments and vessels for the purpose of celebrating the sacraments, which being consecrated by these ministrations are called holy. Do we pray unto them because through them we pray to God? This is the chief cause of this insane progena, progenity, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, that the figure resembling the living person, the idol, which induces men to worship it, hath more influence than the evident fact that it is not living and so it ought to be despised by the living. And so the point I want to make is when we read this passage, because Christians will literally consecrate the image for use, for holy use to be, let's say, a, a something for veneration. They're talking about when they consecrate the Eucharist, the pagans confuse us that the instruments themselves have been consecrated like a pagan idol that they become indwelt by the deity. And so Augustine's clearly responding to a pagan polemical excess. And he responds against this ex exaggerated accusation by making a, a counter accusation pretty much in the same mold. Now, I think there are implications of taking a face value that contradict the, the theology of iconodualism, which is what the other Paul is inferring here. 
But I just want to say that this may be simply a polemical extreme in the Latin context because they didn't kiss images in the Latin context. They would pray towards the image like we see of the Good Shepherd. They did not offer it sacrifices. Here, they, they say that they, um, but with their images, that they offer ministrations to them, right? And so Augustine is um, disputing ministrations and things like this. So Augustine even makes uh, this point that he accuses the priest, the pagan priest, of offering victims to images and imputing that they consecrate these objects and turn them into living vessels of deities. It is precisely this that he defines in adoration. And for example, you can find that in Sermon 198, uh, paragraph 16 to 17. And so I think if people understand Augustine in more context, they're going to realize he is by no means um, actually disputing Christian images. And before people then jump to another passage from Augustine where he actually talks about worshipers of tombs and pictures, and they go, well, look, there it is. He's saying the Christians have worshipers of tombs and pictures, and he wished he didn't have them. He means literal worship because he actually doesn't mind veneration of tombs. He speaks about this in several places, including in City of God. He doesn't like the excessive forms of veneration. He criticizes his own mother for these excessive forms of veneration because they left sacrifices to the idols. And Augustine and St. Ambrose and others were against that. So I think when people read these passages in quote minds and they have never like read the saint in any context, they've never taken a single book from the saint and read him cover to cover so they have no idea how these men think, they come to radically wrong conclusions. Thank you very much for the response. Craig Turton, floor is yours. I think one of the challenges, I, I, well, I, would, I would agree with the idea that if you're just getting a quote book and going through it and reading the, the what seems to be an interesting quote by itself, you have a danger of taking it out of context and not seeing the whole the bigger picture. So to the extent that the, the suggestion is go and actually read the rest of the chapter, read the rest of the paragraph, see what this is about, I affirm that point. As to this specific one about the uh, exposition on Psalm 115, I think the key, the, there's, the, there's this saying about the, the detective investigating the crime is interested in the dog that didn't bark. And in this case, the dog that didn't bark is Augustine saying, that the difference between the practice of these pagans and the practice of Christianity is that the pagan thing represents a false god and that the Christian uh, pictures represent God and the saints. If that were the distinction that Augustine had in mind, one might expect him to bring that up rather than his defense that in this is in the, if you go and read it, it's in section seven in the enumeration I have here where he says, but don't we have these vessels that are consecrated to God that are used in our worship? So we have these things that are somehow set apart for God. They're a work of man's hands in that sense. They're, you know, it's not, we didn't just find this cup. It, somebody made it and we use it for a religious purpose. That he goes to the cups. Like if he has, if he had a picture of Jesus on one side of his church and a picture of Mary on the other side of his church, you might think he'd go there before going to the cups, but he goes to the cups. And then he said he he makes his argument against them. But does he does his argument that the cups represent God, the true God, the living God, but their uh, idols represent nothing or their imagination? No. So the question is, does Augustine's arguments, his polemic against this false gods, is it the kind of argument you would expect from someone who has a church with an echinostasis up front? with the door in it through which people go to get the sacrament. And the short answer is it doesn't sound like what you'd expect if that's a, say, uh, Augustine's church. So probably he wasn't in such a church at that time, and he probably, this would be an unfamiliar look, and this practice that's now common in Orthodox churches is not the kind of church that Augustine was in at that time. And so that's the reason he doesn't argue that way, probably, because he doesn't have that. Now, he does acknowledge some people do have this religious veneration of columns, I think is one of the ways that it's translated, what he, what he described there. I don't know if, I'm not sure I would agree that the, the answer lies in the fact that sacrifices are offered uh, as, a, as distinct from the fact that it's religious veneration. But uh, maybe I have to do another debate on Augustine and images if that's something people are really interested in. I mean, uh, it's my, my response, because I have the last word, 
would be this is why people just they have to read more of Augustine in context. Augustine says in um, uh, Sermon 198 on particular that point, you people also have your adorers, that's people or Christians, of columns and sometimes even of pictures. And would to God that we didn't have them, Augustine says. That is not what the church teaches you, I mean. Which priest of theirs, that's the pagan priest, ever climbed into a pulpit and from there commanded the people not to adore idols? Now, wait for a second and think, well, what's how is he define adoration, all right? And that we in Christ publicly preach against the adoration of columns or of the stones or the buildings in holy places or even of pictures, all right? So now, if we read that isolation, we go, that means they must not have pictures, they don't have holy places, columns, whatever those are, etc. Then we know churches were built with columns inside, by the way. But that being said, he says, on the contrary, indeed, it was their very priest who used to turn to the idols and offer them victims for their congregations and would still like to do so now. All right? So... His issue is with propitiatory sacrifice given to those things. And he denies we preach against sacrificing to those things. We don't sacrifice to our holy objects, to columns in our churches, to our pictures. That's what his actual response is. But because people don't read this stuff in context, and there's way more to Augustine because he actually has some very negative things even about visualization in your mind and just too much for today. The point is... People think it's against that kind of dulia, and they're just reading it utterly divorced in the context of the critique being given. They're critiquing um, pagan idolatry, and you can't take a critique of pagan idolatry and just presuppose it, it's one for one the same with orthodox iconodulia. I mean, that's just begging the question. All right, Craig, thank you for the final word. We've got a, a super chat from Eric Peterson. Thank you very much. I mean, that's $20, so he should be able to ask the question twice. Yeah, not exactly. So we got to make it worth his while in terms of the answers. Uh, actually, it looks like he's saying it's more of a statement. So he might be coming at one yet, which means feel free to respond as you like Well, that's like why he's to. spending so much money. It's not even a question. He's got to make sure he could get a statement in. Right. So here, so here we go. Eric, appreciate it. Thanks for the support. Okay. So I he think says, no way does anyone read the scriptures and come away thinking we need to paint pictures to venerate. So it looks like he's coming at you, Craig, which means you have my permission to come back at him if you'd like. Go I'm ahead. just going to say he spent the money. Sure. You're right. You're right for now. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You guys are both good sports. And I do have to say, this has been an excellent debate. I'm enjoying the Q&A as well. So to the audience, lots of good questions. Uh, like every other portion of this debate, the audience Q&A is flying by. So we'll go one or two more questions, and then we'll have to um, wrap it up. But we have gotten through a good portion of them. So let's see here. We've got a question for the both of you that has come in from, here we go, Stephen Tibbetts. Question for both of you. Would either debater feel that the Shroud of Turin, he says urine, guess in Turin, should be worshipped? What are your thoughts, uh, who's, who's first? <laughs> <laughs> Turn well, to I, I, start. I, oh, yeah. sure. Go ahead, Craig. It's up to no, you. No, no. I mean, one, not worship. We could we venerate holy images. Uh, two, the Orthodox permit for the, or, the veneration images that aren't strictly from the Orthodox Church. Um... As for the Shroud of Turin, um, I haven't looked into it. I don't know precisely what's depicted. Um, the fact, I mean, I presume, I don't want to offend Roman Catholics because they've probably been liking me the last couple hours. I presume it's a fraud. And so, like, being that it was made to deceive people kind of gives me a bad feeling about it. Um, but I think if someone simply just presumes it's true and wants to show affection to God because they think that really was touching God, um, and all that, then I think that would be allowable. So I think a lot does go into intent. All right, Craig, appreciate it. Turretin, what are your thoughts on the Shroud of Turin? The Shroud of Turin doesn't match the New Testament depiction of how Christ was buried. It doesn't match the New Testament depiction of what's the appropriate hairstyle for a man. It all says it's a shame for a man to have long hair. This shroud, the model for the shroud has long hair the oh and they have radiocarbon dated the cloth of the shroud and it's not old enough to have been around in the first century uh, it, it looks like a like a late medieval creation very cleverly done 
and maybe an early example of kind of the the work of the the scientists of the day experimenting with a very very early form of photography perhaps that's what it is but in any event it's as far as being an image of jesus christ it's not uh it's a it's in to the extent that it's intended as that it's just a a, a very obvious forgery uh to the extent that it's uh, it, that there be any other reason to worship it, absolutely not. And it's just something that should be, you know. Yeah, aren't the out. nails like through both his feet at the same time instead of separately? If I remember right, like, you know, that's not part of actual historic crucifixion practice. The Orthodox crucifixes don't contain that either. Um, I don't know. I'll leave that to people to know more about, I guess. I'm just thinking aloud. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, his head was separately wrapped. That is one one of the things that the New Testament tells us. And oh, so it's just the head. It's not no other parts of the body. No, the the shroud is the whole body from head. Oh, to Oh, okay. But the, the the New Testament says the head was separately wrapped. So, and, yeah, no, well, well, yeah, of course, yep. And there's like seventy five pounds of spices wrapped in there as well. And there's just you know not, it's just not real. It's it's fake. Well, gentlemen. Appreciate the responses. That might be a hot topic to debate at some point in the future to anybody interested. The Shroud of Turin. I don't think we've hosted that topic before. So, okay, let's, uh, looks like the other Paul has another question for you, Craig. I am assuming you and the other Paul know each other well, possibly. So question for Craig. The worship of God through the ark was predicated on his actual presence within it. Would you say God slash the saints also possess images which the fathers condemned in idols well i'm not sure i'd grant the question at least in its entirety right because god wasn't in the ark it was his footstool uh traditionally right that he could step down onto the ark i guess from heaven um and so the veneration was be for on once i think twofold one because like whenever god touches something like the chalice even the chalice is empty we could venerate the chalice in orthodoxy it's because god physically touched it um, and two, because there could be representation, representations on the chalice, chalice could have icons of Christ or even Tertullian's time, the good shepherd. Uh, but the ark would have been a representation of the invisible God, which is why the, the cherubim, um, are pointed towards nothing, you know? So I think it serves both those functions, which again, the chalice does today, which by the way, is a interesting continuity of old and new Testament. Thank you, Craig. Turretin, go ahead. I guess in in addition to what the other Paul pointed out, I would add that the Ark, when it was not in the holiest of holies, and they're and they are surrounded by uh, curtains so that no one could see it except the high priest once a year. Uh, the when it was out in public, it was covered. It was supposed to be covered. And the one time when somebody tried to go peek in the ark, the, the God severely punished people for doing so. So there, it, it was not, although there were cherubim uh, on top of the ark, those weren't seen by people who would be bowing down in the direction of the ark. Thank you, I guess Turretin. I'll just respond. Yeah, go ahead. The uh, priesthood of all believers, why we see behind the curtain. That's why we all have access to the chalice. That's the connection. Well, gentlemen, you've both endured to the end of this excellent debate. I've really enjoyed it. I know the audience has as well. We've had a lot of um, engagement in the, in the side chat with a ton of questions that could keep us busy for another couple hours, but we have to wrap it up somewhere and we are in bonus minutes. So I wanna respect both of your time tonight, Craig, and Turretin, this really was a fantastic debate. So why don't we get some uh, quick final words, final thoughts. I do appreciate the time. And Craig, tonight was your first time here on the platform. So I appreciate you being uh, willing to debate here. Let's hand it to you for some final words, final thoughts. Just uh, great to be here. Great to be with Turretin fan. I uh, hope I didn't get too excited. I think I did. So please forgive me if I did. We like and... excitement here, Craig. <laughs> Turretin fan is not too excitable. It's pretty cool, actually. I, I like that even keelness. Um, other than it's just great to be here. 
Uh, if this has made you think of something you haven't thought of before, um, that is really good because this requires fasting and prayer to discern. These are not things we could just wrap our brains around just like that. It requires fasting and prayer. And uh, for all those who appreciate my work, I'd ask that uh, they support the parishes in Cambodia, that they support some sort of good work. Um, and I'd appreciate that. So you can follow me on my channel, my website, and, uh, and I'll leave it there. Craig, thank you for the final words, final thoughts, your relevant links here, your website, and also your YouTube channel is in the chat, also in the description box for people to check out. Turretin fan, as always, thank you for giving us your time for uh, this debate and all the other debates you participate in. Uh, final words, final thoughts. I wanted to uh, thank Craig. It's good that you uh, agreed to come here for our debate. I think it's uh, it was great debating with you. I appreciate your uh, ironic tone on a subject that uh, is a serious subject. I mean, if if you're if the Seventh Ecumenical Council is right, I'm in big trouble, and that's something that we should take seriously. It, it's not. I mean, it's it might be easy to kind of joke around about it, but you know, we should we should take the claim seriously. And then, uh, you know, at, at the same time, if I'm correct, and this is a form of idolatry, then it's something that a, a large chunk of people have fallen into. Not not only the uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, but also the Roman Catholic churches. So. Uh, we, you know, it's a, it's something that should be taken seriously by people. I hope people do. I think there was a, there are some uh, serious questions, and also I saw something from HG about uh, chicken tenders, which was a little bit less serious of a question. But I do hope that people will search the scriptures and look through the uh, the, the the fathers, look through Augustine and, and the other fathers we talked about, and see what do they say before the Seventh Ecumenical Council in the in what writings that they have. What, what do they uh, what do they teach us about that? Turretin, thank you for the final words, final thoughts, and to you as well. If people like what they're seeing from Turretin and they want to uh, find more about you, your content, so on and so forth, subscribe to Turretin Fan here, your YouTube channel, and also your website. So uh, to our guests, again, thank you for making for a debate to remember. Turretin, you'll be back here in a week or so, I believe, for this much anticipated two verse two debate on soteriology so a lot of people hype for that one including myself so okay craig and turton we're gonna let uh you gentlemen uh get out of here and enjoy your uh, nights uh well deserved so great debate and to the audience i'll be back in about 30 seconds for some reminders and announcements god bless All right, all. I am back. I'm back for a little bit. I want to go over um, a few of the things that we do have for you for the coming months. I've been saying I want to make this the summer of debates. Uh, last year, I said the same thing. Last year was, I mean, we, we had a lot of awesome events, a lot of main events. Uh, did about four or five debates a week. And um, this summer is going to be no different. We've I've got main events booked uh, into September, actually. I've just booked one uh, debate for September, one that a lot of people have wanted to see, Pastor Anthony Aquino versus Dr. Don Preston on the Millennium. So that one is scheduled for September 15th. And um, yeah, let me go over a few of the events. The last week or two, we've had several big debates that I'd like to remind people to check out. So we just had the Marian Dogmas debate. Steve Christie, Dr. Robert Sengenis. I think we announced this about five or six months ago. So it shows me how quickly time flies by. We just had this about a week ago. I think it was last Friday. And it really was a, an excellent debate. Steve and Robert, both great debaters. They made for a debate to remember. And we are already in talks to do a round two, hopefully in the summer, maybe wrap up the summer with, with a round two. 
Uh, I also was joined by Dr. Jerry Bergman this week. We did uh, two hours. We demolished uh, human evolution and I made sure it's comprehensive. So uh, for those interested in this topic and they want that go-to video, uh, just kind of refuting all the best arguments for human evolution, we touched on chromosome two fusion, endogenous retroviruses, uh, so-called beneficial mutations. We touched on the hominin fossil record, including everybody's favorite hominin, Strolopithecus afarensis or Lucy. So please do check that uh, one out. I've already booked next month. Jerry will be back here. I believe it's June 19th. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, mutations in general. Also, I want to thank all the supporters. Uh, you guys are the life and blood of this channel. You guys make this happen. We did just hit 3 million views. So uh, God bless you for that. If you're new to this channel and you're addicted to debates like myself, please do check the debates playlist section titled uh, Debates Hosted by Standing for Truth. And you'll find at this point about 310 on all sorts of topics. Now, next week, we've got our open mic debate night. And so Matt Slick, I've already confirmed with today, this is going to be a lot of fun. From my understanding, we've already got about four or five people of differing views to the Trinity. So people who hold the oneness, modalism, Unitarianism, monarchianism. And so we got a few people already set to take on Matt Slick for this open mic. But it is an open mic, so it's not like a formal debate. And we do a lot of open mics on this channel on different topics. So this is basically your night and it's your opportunity to just jump in, click the link, think of it like a radio program. We're going to have some fun. We're going to duke it out in, in the deba debate dojo uh, for probably three or four hours. I think this is going to be this is going to be a long one. It's going to be fun. Then the next week, we've got another open mic on the Trinity. This time it'll be Kelly Powers as our guest. And so he'll be here enduring for three to four hours, taking on anybody who wants to join. So anybody who's anti-Trinity, uh, bring your best arguments. And then in the middle of next week, we've got Anthony Rogers here, uh, possibly debating, but he'll be here for sure. So if not debating, he'll be giving a presentation on Philippians 2 followed by an audience Q&A. So we're going to make that interactive as well. Um, at the end of the month, we've got some debates on eschatology and dispensationalism. So a lot of people uh, interested in these kinds of debates. So we want to mix it up for you. So end of the month, Nick Sayers, Pastor Tommy McMurtry is the pre-tribulation rapture biblical that should be a good one. And then uh, the very next week, Pastor Matt First and Nick Sayers debating is replacement theology biblical. So two hot topics, controversial topics, which uh, is, is good to get those kinds of debates in here once in a while. Another controversial topic, uh, the very next month in June, Pastor Scott Clem, Mark White. Mark, I saw you in the chat. Good to see you as always. Is there a geopolitical future for national Israel? So this is going to be, a, I've already had people message me saying that they're pumped to see this one. Should be an interesting live chat for sure. Uh, then we've also got some good debates on soteriology. So uh, Charles Jennings, Kelly Powers, they'll be debating free grace theology versus uh, lordship salvation, of course. I just mentioned we've got Turretin Fan and Dan Chapa. Both excellent debaters, Charles Jennings and Eli Haytov, also uh, great debaters. So this is going to be a two verse two formal debate showdown. I'm pumped for this one. And I believe this is in about a week or so. And therefore, the point is we got a lot for everybody to look forward to. I just booked another dozen debates, uh, several on creation evolution, at least one on the Genesis flood. I've booked... Um, at least one more on soteriology. And so my thumbnail guy, he's going to be busy over the next week. So uh, just look out for events being set here and there as I fill up June and also make my way into July and August. And so uh, with that, I think I'm going to wrap it up here, guys. And I see some people in the chat. Yeah, if you're interested in uh, debating here on Standing for Truth, even if it's your first time, you know, we do host a lot of big debates with... Um, more experienced debaters, well-known uh, debaters, but we also like to uh, host debates with people who may have not debated before. 
And so just reach out to me, uh, my moderator in the chat. Thank you, Doki. Uh, email me, standingfortruthministries at gmail.com. Give me a list of the possible topics that you'd like to engage in. And that way it makes it easy for me to set you up with um, an interested interlocutor. We're always looking for more, uh, more debaters, new guests, fresh faces. So, okay, with that, I am going to wrap it up here. Tonight was a great debate. I really enjoyed it. Another one in the books, as I like to say. So please uh, hit that subscribe button, share around this content. Critical thinking is important, which is exactly why we host uh, so many of these debates on these kinds of uh, topics. It gets us out of our theological echo chambers. It gets us into the debate octagon where we can uh, discuss and engage uh, these topics with people who we uh, differ with. I think this is this is healthy and it's important. So God bless all. Thank you for tuning in and standing for truth is out.